how to make a complete map of every thought you think Lion Kimbro 2003 Contents License II Introduction I I I System Overview V I I I 1 Materials 1 2 General Principles 15 3 Intra Subject Architecture 36 4 Extra Subject Architecture 65 5 Theory of Notebooks 90 to 6 The Question of Computers 99 7 Getting Started 108 the acronyms 113 BCBS information 118 I license this work is licensed under the Creative Commons Attribution Share Alike license. To view a copy of this license, visit creativecommons.org web link or send a letter to Creative Commons 559 Nathan Abbott Way, Stanford, California 94305, USA. I, I introduction this book is about how to make a complete map of everything you think for as long as you like. Whether that's good or not, I don't know. Keeping the map of all your thoughts has a freezing effect on the mind. It takes a lot of albeit pleasurable work, but produces nothing but sight. If you do the things described in this book, you will be immobilized for the duration of your commitment. The immobilization will come on gradually, but steadily. In the end. You will be incapable of going somewhere without your cache of notes, and will always want a pen and paper w slash u. When you do not have pen and paper, you will rely on complex memory pegging devices, described in the memory book. You will never be without record, and you will always record. You may also articulate. Your thoughts will be clearer to you than they have ever been before. You will see things you have never seen before. When someone shows you one corner, You'll have the other three in mind. This is both good and bad. It means you will have the right information at the right time in the right place. It also means you may have trouble shutting up. Your mileage may vary. You will not only be immobilized in the arena of action, but you will also be immobilized in the arena of thought. This appears to be contradictory, but it's not really. When you are writing down your thoughts, you are making them clear to yourself, but when you revise your thoughts, it requires a lot of work you have to update old ideas to point to new ideas. This discourages a lot of new thinking. There is also a structural integrity to your old thoughts that will resist change. You may actively not think certain things, because it would demand a lot of note-keeping work. Thus the notion that notebooks are best applied to things that are not changing. For all of this immobility, this breathing, for all of these negative effects, why on earth would anyone want to do this? because of the incredible clarity that comes with it. It may feel like, doing this, that for the first time in your life, you really have a clear idea of what kinds of thoughts are going through your head. You'll really understand your ideas. And you'll also see connections that you were never consciously aware of before. You'll see a structure and a pattern in your life. Your goals and psychology will become clearer to you. You'll be clearer to I.I.I. Introduction I.V. About what you do not understand. It is like taking a microscope to your brain. You'll see the little thoughts moving around, literally, as you walk them through the maps you discovered within yourself. You'll see what you care about, quite clearly. You'll be familiar with your mental terrain. Incredible clarity. Addictive clarity. Vast clarity. Extraordinary clarity. You will love it, if you are anything like me. It will feel natural and free. There will be a freedom within your mind. You'll create astonishing things, and you'll find great tools that will help you in your life after you are immobilized. Or at least, it will seem that way. Time will tell whether such an experience has been useful to me or not. I still do not know, and will not know for some time now. The experience is very much a modern version of the walkabout. Except for instead of going out there somewhere in the world, you hold up in your mind. Is it useful? I still don't know. Thus it is with great hesitation that I present for the public this work on notebooks. That is, my notebook technique. I want to digress and say something here as well I am astonished that there isn't a field of study of notebooks. I have searched on the net, and while I have found a page here and there on some type of notebook method, it is almost always one of the following two things the diary a bunch of entrees, chronologically based, maybe with a TOC, in which a person keeps a record of their thoughts, aka the journal, the category bins, a bunch of notes, stuff into a category bins, maybe two or three levels deep. That's IP. In all the world, people have only been putting pair notes in the above two ways. Sure, there are a few others, but people aren't comparing notes, 
talking about such things. 1. 2. I would think that something like intelligence augmentation through notebook study would be one of the first things that people talk about on the internet. I would think that one of the first things we would be greeted with on the internet would be, did you know how to use notebooks to be smarter? At the very least, it would be accessible. Instead, there is a vast desert. My solution to understanding this lack is my faith in what I call the anarchist principle if there is something really cool, and you can't understand why somebody hasn't done it before, it's because you haven't done it yourself. That's DIY for those in the know do it yourself. One Ted Nelson in a very special case and deserves particular comment. Sadly, he seems a bit unhinged, and doesn't write much about the topic of keeping notes openly on the web. To know, added later on David Allen's getting things done system is actually pretty cool. Sadly, it does not appear on the internet. But it's a cheap book. If you are interested in contributing to a study of notebook systems, this is a must read. Introduction me now I have a third thing I want to talk about before getting on with the text. 3. I am just spitting this text out. I know that my understanding of personal projects and getting them completed is low. I know my weakness is that I am bad at getting huge projects done. So what I'm doing is just spitting this text out. I figure that if you are reading this, you'd much rather have this than nothing at all. And that's what's out there, if you aren't reading this, nothing at all. I mean, you can always keep a diary or a bunch of category bins, if you like. That's a real no-brainer. But besides those two, and treatises on Ted Nelson's madness, you won't find a whole lot. So please excuse the poor formatting of this. It's raw, coercive, straight text. It's unorganized. It's terrible. Maybe one day I will improve this. But that day is not today. Today is a day for spitting text out. With God's mercy. I will learn how to finish big projects. I pray for that ability frequently. If you can't mentor me in the subject, I will happily hear you out. But I have not learned it yet. For let's see we've talked about one. The terrible things this notebook system will do to you. 2. The non-existence of an internet field of notebook study. 3. How I am just spitting this text out into the world. Lastly. I want to briefly introduce some of the unique features of my notebook system. Things that my notebook system does that no other notebook system that I have ever seen does. These are the results of years of keeping different types of notebook systems, and taking the best ideas from each. One strategy. This notebook system allows you to strategize. Very few notebooks do that. I mean, sure, you can start some pages on, what will my strategy be now? But then you have to figure out what all your options are. The notebook system I described has built-in strategy management. You will always know what your options and priorities are in notebook management. It does this with the aid of maps, two maps. Tables of contents TOCs are terrible. Terrible, terrible, terrible. Their main utility is in providing you the next number to number something. Three first, I wrote about the things that my notebook system will do to you. Then I wrote about the dirt of notebook study on the web, and now I'm writing about this third thing. For I actually believe that we should all communicating with what Robert Horn calls visual verbal language. The problem is that we don't have good tools to do so. Damn. It's a shame. When the tools come, there will be a revolution in communication just as big, if not bigger, than the revolutionary introduction of the internet. So double apologies for swabbing a mass of text that you Introduction The I you want maps of contents, or what I call mocks. This is like a table of contents, but far more dynamic. Is an entry really important? Make its mock entry really big? Unimportant. Make it small. Or even pull out the name, and just surround the page number in parenthesis. If you are ever investigating that area, you can look it up to see what it is. You can put related concepts close to each other regardless of the actual physical position of the pages. You can move things around. Trace paths of connection through. Make non-ordinal order apparent. All with maps. So don't keep a TOC, unless the material is intrinsically linear or chronology, without episode tracking. Keep a mock. More in the text on this subject. This is just a brief introduction for the sake of introducing some major concepts from my notebook system. Three color and glyph management abbreviations slash shorthand.
and color. You must use a four color pen. I mean, you don't need one, but it's so amazingly helpful, that once you start using it, you'll never want to go back. You'll develop short hands, and you'll want to trust that you can decipher them later. You'll thus need systems for cataloging your short hands, and there is such a system in the notebook system I am describing. For speed lists you will be capturing every single thought. Well, every thought that is more interesting than I need to go to the bathroom, or I need to take the trash out. Actually, needing to take the trash out may enter, as per the getting things done system. Should you decide to integrate my system with a GTD system? More later on the subject. Speed lists are the answer to the demand. Speed lists are vast lists of simple thoughts, about 1 to 50 words, generally around one line. There are two types of speed lists, pan subject and subject. Pan subject speed lists are for all thoughts, you take the pan subject speed list out with you to work or to wherever you are going. Subject lists you keep in a cash notebook, and you have one per subject. You'd prefer to just use your subject lists, but sometimes you have to make do with a pan subject speed list and then transfer out from there to the individual speed lists. More on all of this later. In particular you do not want to be just scribbling thoughts out on a piece of any old paper. You want at least a pan subject speed, with a few exceptions. If you are having a thought attack, you may need to make do w slash just any old piece of paper, and then go from there to the subject pages. Okay I'm getting too much into details. So for advantages are strategy mapping color flash glyph introduction VII speeds they work together marvelously. In particular, strategy, mapping, and speeds all directly affect and rely on one another. So there we have it. 1. What this system will do to you. Expect it. 2. The non-existence to date. Of an internet study of notebooks. 3. How I am spitting this text out. The advantages of my system. The introduction is over. System overview I will be talking about the following things in for subject architecture extra subject architecture materials the question of computers. Don't get all excited now. Theory of notebooks general principles so let me talk at a high level about what this is all about. The notebook system roughly divides all of your thoughts into subjects. What subjects? Depends on your thought patterns. In the subjects section. We'll talk about how to divide your thoughts amongst subjects. Now, there are two domains extra subject and intra subject that is, outside and inside of your subjects. Intra subject within a particular subject, you'll have an organization. You'll have your speed thoughts for that subject, you'll have your maps, you'll have your big dissertations point of interest, or poi, you'll have your cheat sheets, your abbreviations slash shorthands a slash s particular to that subject all sorts of wonderful things. Most important though, are your speeds and your maps. Now, beyond the subject, there is a whole field of all your subjects. You'll have the Jizmok, the grand subject map of contents, whereon you'll see a gigantic map of everything that you think about. Just imagine that right now wouldn't you be interested in seeing such a thing? When I think about my Jizmok, I see the mirror of my mind, for the three to five months that I kept my notebooks. The borders are fuzzy, because I gradually evolved into the notebook system I am describing to you. I mean, that, right there, is worth the price of admission. The Jizmok is a pretty impressive thing. Equals equals okay. So there are steps and promises that apply beyond the field of a single subject, and there are steps and promises that apply within the field of a single subject. The III system overview IX now extra subject and intra subject float on top of your materials. We're talking about pen and paper and your binders. And some other things you'll need those little donut hole things to protect your paper, and you'll need little stickies to put onto your paper, your maps. This will help with strategy and other map management functions. So I have a section on materials and all that stuff. Great stuff. What to look for in picking a binder. Wonderful. There we've knocked off the first three intra-subject extra-subject materials three more to go the of computers theory of notebooks general principles okay, I'll take the of computers last general principles first, then theory, then question mark yes of computers general principles there are many patterns common in the steps and promises of the notebook things such as how do I lay out a page 
the concept of late binding and how it applies to the notebooks. Out cards. The use of color. Partitioning strategy. Writing quality. Psychology. General mapping principles. Important stuff, but not specific to a particular position in the hierarchy. Theory of notebooks. Why use notebooks at all? Partly talked about in the introduction. How does this work? Observations about how subjects gestate. How information flows, becomes knowledge, then becomes wisdom as it integrates into our life. How thoughts integrate. How the speeds grow. And a theory of conscious thinking. Many things to talk about. Finally, the question of computers. My least favorite subject, because people can get so damn irrational about computers. I don't know how many times I've seen people twiddling about with their little palm pilots convinced that because they have technology on their side, that they are being more effective than a man holding a piece of paper and a pen. The absurdity of these devices is astounding. I know that there are legitimate uses for these things. I see doctors carrying them around with up-to-date info dictionaries and whatnot, I know that they use them. Yeah, 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 yeah. And yet the simple fact is, 99 m. They'd be much better served with a small pad of paper that they keep with them and a pen. There are exceptions to this you can argue a good case for using them to play games though I'd rather use a Game Boy Advance, or for using them to use as an address book. Great. I love it. System Overview X but for the love of God, if you live within the time period of 2003 to 2005 at the very least, do not try to use one of these devices to keep your notes. This extends further to computers. Now all this will change. In the future, computers will be the way to go. But we are not there yet, nor will we be there in the next three to five years. Remember even if the computer is fast, you still need software that won't get in your way. I will address this subject again, later in the book. Feel free to skip it, if you plan to use paper. But if you are one of the I pay big money for this thing, and it's high tech, and it's so cyber, that it must be better than anything pen and paper can give me. Please give serious thought to what I have to say. I'm positioning it later in the book, so that you can have already have read about maps. I mean, maps right there, these little devices, and even my big computer, doesn't get maps right. But you'll see how this works as we read, no need for me to go off the deep end now. So, in summary intra-subject extra subject materials the of computers theory of notebooks general principles that's what I'm going to be talking about now. Here, let's put that in order 1. Material 2. General Principles 3. Intra-subject 4. Extra-subject 5. Theory of Notebooks 6. The question of computers by the way, in case I hurt your feelings about computers, I want to add two things system overview XI1. I am an experienced programmer. I've been programming computers since I was 7 years old typing in basic it programs by hand on my mom's compact 8088. I formatted her hard drive by accidentally going into low-level format instructions using debug, experimenting with assembly language, when I was about 10. I am now 25. I love computers. I just happen to recognize the limitations of where we are at right now, that's all. 2. Computers will be the salvation of this whole system I am describing right now. So if you feel offended knowing that I am dumping on them right now, know that that's not going to be the case for long. Paper is unwieldy, large, requires storage, and a host of other hills. Copying from page to page to page is just a nightmare. It is a necessary nightmare, right now, but it is a nightmare. Computers will save us from it. 3. Ha! I'm sneaking in a number 3. Part of my no-edit policy when spitting stuff out. Apologies. I will describe, if I do not forget, just what steps you can take now, if you are interested, to get the ball rolling. There are some easy programs that you can make right now that would make this system awesome. I just don't have the time to code them up right now. But I will describe them, and if you like, you can code them up. Help, I'll even throw in a description of the ideal computer notebook system, assuming I have magic paper and how it will dramatically increase our intelligence, provided that we can solve the versioning problem as well. Note Ted Nelson and company went pretty bad EWRD the versioning problem. Did they solve it? I don't know. 
I have heard rumors that some of Ted's protégés work for the CIA now, though. Speaking of the CIA, I want to include in this book somewhere right here I guess a comparison between this notebook system, and an intelligence agency. Intelligence is having good information available at the right time at the right place. Notebooks help with that by moving information to a place where it will be seen at the right time, when you access the notebook. There are a lot of similarities here with an intelligence agency. Okay. I'm done. Interlude out. 5. Where were we? 1. Material 2. General Principles 3. Intrasubject 4. Extra Subject 5. Yes, I do recognize the irony. I'm just spitting this out with poor organization. But damn it, I'm not a skilled writer, and I have so much I want to express, so you'll just have to make do for now. Sorry. System Overview XII 5. Theory of Notebooks 6. The Question of Computers 7. Getting Started OK. And be aware I'll probably need to skip back and forth a little bit. Sorry, just one of the problems of having a straight linear text, rather than a fully mapped out domain. Chapter 1 Materials Some Topics 4 Materials Paper Pen Binders 3 Hole Punch Donut Rings Sticky Snot Yellow Sticky Tabs Tab Dividers Pockets and Associated Issues Storage Carrying Archival Handling Optimization So let's start with the materials, what you need to have with you. 1 Chapter 1 Material to pen you need a pen. Actually, you need three. And they need to have little for color clippers, red, green, blue, and black. Theoretically, you can do this all with a black pen, but trust me, you don't want it. Your ability to very rapidly switch colors will weigh more than make up for the nicer line that the G2Gel pens give you. Really. You need one to carry with you, you need one for backup, placed in a trusted place and you need one to be a backup to the backup. Yes, you really need this. If you are wasting time looking for a pen that you lost, you are just wasting time. The pen will come back. In the meantime, you need to write, so you've got to fetch your backup. You have a backup to the backup. If you have ready access to a store, you need to buy another pen, should you not find your first pen by then. These for color pens are expensive. Remember by three. Your pen is your life, don't lose it. But when you do, don't hesitate to start in with the backup. Next you want to have a list in your notes of the locations to search for your pen. Mine look like this one. Jacket 2. Pockets 3. Pants 4. Pockets 5. Buried 6. Inside notebooks. Read the last buried inside notebooks. If you do this system, that will actually be a very common occurrence because you'll have to to 3 inches of paper. Those for color pens are be easy and fat, but they aren't so big that they can't get completely lost amidst a big fat chunk of paper. Trust me. So actually open up the book and flip through sections looking for your pen. I'm not going to talk about this much, this is just something you'll find with experience. So that's the deal with the pen. I'll talk more about what the colors are for in the general principles section. Next paper you want lots of it. Always have at least two reams of opened, of about 150 sheets each. Get college rule. You want as many lines on these as you can, because information density is the name of the game. Three holes, of course, so it'll go in your binder. Chapter 1. Material 3 8 and 1 half x 11, or the new 8 x 10 and 1 half. Don't laugh, it's a serious question. There are trade-offs to both. I used 8x10 one half for most of my notes. It was good because they fit within the larger tab dividers. Yeah. 8x10.5 is also a lot cheaper. With the volume of paper that you will purchase, price can become an issue. But if I were to do this again and I intend to, I intend to do this once, for three months, once every three to five years, to gain the situation awareness I would use full 8.5x11. Why? It's not really the extra bit of page that is important, it isn't, having a better rule is far more important, but rather that your paper conforms to the global standard for paper. You are invariably going to want to include leafs from outside your notebook system. And you should eventually make your own templated paper you'll make standard form sheets, print them onto printer paper, and include it in your notebook. Printer paper doesn't come in 8.5x11. So you have some big pages and some little pages. 
Yuck! When it comes to quickly flipping through pages to find a particular page number, yuck! It gets difficult. So get 8.5x11 college ruled 3 hole punch paper. Binders major important. First, let me dispel notebooks don't use them. I'm talking about spiral bound notebooks. I used to use them. I have a huge collection of spiral bound notebooks in my closet. I love them, they are so cute and self contained. And petitioning them is kind of fun, even. But the binder system just so completely blows them out of the water that I will just never go back to those things. This isn't to say that notebooks don't have a place, they do. Just not in this system. Notebooks are great when you are doing the straight chronology. Or you are keeping just records. Not a big fat intricate total thought keeping system that I am describing here, but rather, I'm talking about, you have a business, and you are keeping records for it, and so you buy the notebook because it's nice and self-contained and stuff like that. Another nice thing is that you know the pages aren't going anywhere. There are times where that's not what you want. And you can turn pages easier. It's just easier. But this system that I am describing impossible. You cannot do it like that. In this system I am describing, you must be able to insert pages between pages. And it's so incredibly useful to be able to lift 50 sheets and put them in another binder entirely. Okay, so, please don't use notebooks. You will die. Quickly. Chapter 1. Materials for now. On to binders. What you want to look for inside pockets transparent outside pockets obstructions on the outside spine sheet lifters ring type width flash size durable versus sucky so, let me start with the last one. I forget what they call the non-durable ones. They cost less. Maybe economy or something like that. Don't get them. Yes, they are cheaper. But, even on the budget that I'm on, you do not want them. Because they are going to snap open when they shouldn't. Believe me, there's nothing worse than being on the bus, hitting the notebook the wrong way, and suddenly wham, 100 pages on the floor. Luckily they are numbered and you can put them all back in the original order, but trust me, go with durable. You'll have to unchink both sides to open the ring, but you'll do so with the knowledge that it's keeping your data safe. Durable. All the way. Okay, next, we'll talk about width, flash size and the ring type. If you are getting, say, a 1 negative 1.5 notebook my carry about notebook if somewhere in there, then just get the normal rings. They are three loops, bound to a metal binding, blah blah blah. But if you are getting anything larger and you should have at least one of these, for your common store, it's going to be big, then you want to get what I call a half loop. I'm sure there's formal names for this stuff, but I don't care. These things look like one half is a loop as normal, but the other half is straight, and has a 90 degree crook at the end. Also, it's not attached to the binding of the binder, it's attached to the back side of the binder. These things are so great. It costs more, but get it. What it does is it keeps your papers from flying out all over the place when you open your deeply packed notebook. That little 90 degree crook stops the pages. It's great. You'll have to see it to believe it, but d it's wonderful. So big notebook, get the half loop. Small notebook, I think they are all just normal full loops. Never seen a small notebook with a half loop. Sheet lifters. If your binder has a sheet lifter, awesome. I like these. I'm not sure why. They just seem to help. This is more of a spiritual belief on my part, I'm not really sure. But I leave them there and they seem to be useful. Chapter 1 Materials 5 Now I'll talk about inside and outside pockets, and then the possible obstructions on the outer spine. Then we'll be done talking about binders. It's a fetish thing, I guess. The inside pockets are really useful. I use them to store tags in when they aren't in use. Oh, remember that you if you could bought those pockets, right? Stick one at the front of every binder. Store donut holes and stickies in them. That's just the place to do it. And you'll store the tags guts in there too. You know, these long sheets of one wide paper, perforated at about one sixth in height. You write whatever the tag's name is on them, tear them off, and put them in the tab page, right? And then you put the tab page into your notes, and you can quickly flip to them. Tab page guts. 
You know what I'm talking about, right? Good. One day, I may, or someone may, put pictures in this description. Then those of you who don't get tap guts can see what I mean. In the inside pockets, you'll store larger things like your tab pages themselves. And when people give you stuff, and of course they didn't trickle hole punch it, you'll put it in there until you get home and punch it yourself. Outside pockets. This is really important. You're going to identify your notebooks quickly by the outside pockets. You can get away with not doing this, but it's a pain in the butt. Pay the extra money. This is becoming a theme, is it not? Trust me, I'm not rich. If you haven't picked up by reading this yet, hey, I'm a programmer, and it's the year 2003 but pay the extra money nonetheless and get the pockets. Here's what I do with them for archive notebooks, I put the letters that are archived. For example, A M and N Z. My common access notebook a big fat one doesn't have covers. I think that's because I got it for free at a college giveaway, and wasn't being picky. No matter, it is jet black and none of the others are, so I can easily identify it. My carried about notebook has, default, two pictures of lions on it. My name is Lion, so I put lions in there, and people are able to put it together that it's mine. The lions are smiling, and it communicates something of my nature to people. I think, but usually the default isn't there. I keep a variant of the GTD system running getting things done by David Talent, and so I generally have my day's alerts options, and chores on the very front. Not that this is strictly defined in GTD, but I've adapted it a bit. And I usually have on the back cover, covering the lion, the general plan for how my day will go out and bus trips transit.metrocasey.gov for the day. It is very, very useful. Finally, you want to look at the spine, if you have outside pockets, and make sure it is not obstructed. Frequently there are three bolts on the outer spine and they sometimes pass it through the transparent pocket on the spine. No, no, no. We don't want that. Chapter 1. Material 6 That means you can't stick an identifying paper back there. Or if you can't, you can only dig it in half an inch. No, that's not for you. You want to be able to put a paper in there that has the name of the binder on it, so you can quickly ID it when a bunch of binders are stacked in a row. There. I am done dissecting binders. If I omitted something, mail me at lion at speakeasy.org 3 hole punch again. You're going to want to print out sheets, and then include them. Or you're going to want to include things that people give you. Very well then, you're going to need to x 3 hole punch it. It's a wonderful tool to have, and it will go a long way. I absolutely adore mine. Let's go through these small items quickly. Donut rings. I don't know what the official name is for these things. They are flat, round, have a hole in the middle, and a reinforced paper. When you have a lot of papers in your notebook, they will eventually start to rip at the holes. The rip will grow and grow, and the next thing you know, your paper doesn't stay inside your notebook. The solution is to, when one hole tears, immediately reinforce all three with these donut rings. I don't know if you need to, but to be safe, I put six old rings to a page. Three on the front of the holes, and three on the back. I've never had a problem since. I've never seen the donut tears. Stickies okay, these are not yellow sticky tabs. What these are, are these little tiny stickers that look like small rectangles. They are about 0.5 wide, if that. You can stick and unstick and rest them to paper, and the paper does not tear or draw pink as you do so. These are amazingly useful. You will use these extensively as you strategize over your notebook. A brief explanation for now strategy is ultra time sensitive. It also involves a lot of prioritizing, and the priorities will change, rapidly. You don't want to mix up your rapid change stuff with your low change stuff. That is, you don't want permanent marks on your pages or things that are changing rapidly. So you use these stickies. On your Tzimok grand subject map of contents, you'll have stickies pointing you to major important areas of work or thought. You'll take them off then they cease to be important, or when you fulfill them. The same goes for the subject maps within each subject. Chapter 1. Material 7 That's basically it. Small idea, but extremely useful. I'll write more about it when it comes time to talk about it. Tag dividers You will use these to keep your subjects apart. 
and a few other things. Pockets now I really don't know what these things are called. My girlfriend got them for me by stealing a few from work. When I saw them, I understood why. These are little pockets, that you can stick anywhere. They have a plastic white back, and a transparent front. The back and front form the pocket, which opens from above, and is sealed around the edge. But the back also has a sticky thing. You peel off the layer, and you can stick the whole pocket anywhere. This is very useful. I use the pocket to store the following things my donut holes my sticky stamps as in postal stamps it has worked like a charm. So in recap, your shopping list is paper, get about 8 reams, college rule, 8.5x11, to start with. Pen, 3 for a color pens, x3 hole punch, get it at a thrift store if you want it cheap. Donut holes, get 1 to 2 packages of many sheets. Stickies, get 1 to 2 packages of many sheets. Tab dividers, get about 50 tabs. To start with, pockets, if you can't find them, get at least 4 or 5. Now, we talked about transport issues, storage, carrying, archival handling, optimizations, chapter 1. Material 8 storage, carrying, and archival will be one big topic here. It's all intermingled. So, you are keeping notes. You have papers. Here is a sort of scale of your papers 1. Scrawled notes on fortune cookie papers, backs of napkins, etc. 2. Scrawled notes on blank paper. 3. Notes collected onto pan subject speed lists. 4. Notes collected in your carry about binder. 5. Notes collected in your common store binder. 6. Notes in the archive. There is another category, hovering around 5.5 special purpose collections. For example, I have a binder for computers. In it, it has subjects such as networking, Debian, programming, software, XSLT, etc., etc. I should mention there is also item 00 stored in your mind on a peg list. I'll talk about that later. If I forget to, mail me. And let me know that I forgot lion at speakeasy.org. Yes, I know that I could keep a list of promises to keep here in my Max Buffer. But to be frank, after having been keeping so many lists for so many months, that I really just don't feel like making one. Pardon my rudeness, but if you actually do what I am describing here, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Back to the subject at hand. So let me describe each of these sources. Scrawled notes on fortune cookie papers sometimes, you just flat out don't have your carry about binder with you. And you don't have your pants subject speech paper. And you don't even have a blank paper. And your peg list is full, or you don't feel like cycling it. So you just have to make do with what you have. You put a note on the back of the envelope and stuff it in your pocket. Or you take that fortune cookie slip out and write on it. Or whatever. Great. I mean, it sucks. But at least you got the thought. Good for you. Scrawled notes on blank paper or maybe you have a blank piece of paper in reach. Write the thought of it, and put it in your pocket. Pan subject speech but if you can't, be prepared in the morning, and put the pan subject speech page in your pocket. I'll talk much more about speeds in my exposition on intrasubject architecture, but a little bit should appear here. Chapter 1 Material 9 The Pan Subjects Speech Page is optimized to have graduate student rule. This is beyond college rule. You want 40 plus lines on a Pan Subjects Speed Page to cram thoughts into. Again density is the name of the game. Furthermore, the Pan Subjects Speeds is petitioned. It has transcription check off subject hint content you can put whatever you want in there. Mine also has a place for a psi marker. That's where you list what type of thought it is, in terms of principle or observation or warning or possible action or goal or problem or starting point or a host of other glyphs. I'm not going to talk about these because they are beyond the scope of notebooks. They go more into mental techniques, has to do with mental structure and the anatomy of thought. While related and quite fascinating, I'm just not going to go there. Whole nother discussion for a whole nother day. The point is, the format is malleable include whatever you want. I also have a date marker at the top of the page, for the chrono archives. Whatever you want. Do not put thought numbers on the pan subject speech page though. Bad idea. 
The purpose of the pan subject speeds is to be a temporary placeholder for ideas. So what are these four things transcription check off you check the box after you have moved the idea out to where it needs to go. Don't check it when you first put the thought in subject this will tell what subject the thought will go into. Remember the subjects are the big things divided by the tab delimiters that have their whole own infrastructure on their own that I will describe later. Hint now, this is a quick one to two word, maybe three word description of how this thought fits into things. Something I learned late, but that is very important and very essential to this whole process is that when a new thought appears it doesn't do so in a vacuum it does so in a context. Words to the wise. So the hint describes the context. This is very important. The context is fresh in your mind when you get the thought. It would take a while to recognize the thought, and then identify the context, if you didn't. I used to try to think of every context a thought could fit in, and then try to place it in as many places as I could. While this is the strategy to chapter 1. Material 10 Pursue when using the computer system 1. This is not the strategy to pursue in the paper system. Besides, the thought is most useful in the original context, 95 the time. And your hint, that's going to be used. In some respects, it's even more important than the thought itself. Because, as you will see if you do this for a while, it is structure and integration that is important. Actual contents of the thoughts are far less meaningful. Once you have the structure in front of you, the content because almost obvious, we'll use that fact in a bit, as we shorten titles to just speed numbers. Don't worry about that now, though. And then there's the content of the thought itself. Now, say you're in a hurry, right? You just want to jot down a thought. You're running medical records, and you can't carry your carry binder with you as you do so. Hey, there are limitations in life. But you were good and folded up the pan subject speeds with you to carry around. You unfold it, and write down the content of the thought, greatly abbreviated, into an open content slot. Do you have to fill in the hint as well? And the subject? No. Just wait for break. In break, you can flesh out the content if you like, and you can also fill in the subject and the hint. It won't be hard. Just don't wait a whole day to get to it, do it soon. Now focus your thoughts on the very next work step, because you want to stop thinking ASAP. Note that the pan subject speech paper is far better than a blank piece of paper, because it provides order and space to fill in. Believe me when you start transcribing off the pan subject speeds to the speed pages, you'll understand how useful this island next notes collected in your carryabout. Binder your carryabout binder will be your best friend. That's right you are going to carry this every place that you can. Going to the movies. Riding the bus. Wherever you go, your carry about binder is going with you. Thus you will want to be very particular, even religious, about your carry about binder. Note as mentioned, there will be times where you will be ripped apart from your carry about binder by force of circumstance. If you can't, bring the pan subject speed with you. Always keep your carry about well stocked with pan subject speed so that when you depart, you can carry a catch away with you. The catch catch is a word I use to describe any device that is used to keep thoughts as they come. There are two basic types of thinking intentional and incidental. The intentional is you sitting down, thinking some issue out. You'll be doing that, mostly amidst poise point of interest pages. But most of your thoughts will come while one see speakeasy.org lion slash weird html to see an example of this chapter 1. Material 11 you are out and about so you'll have to catch them. There are various traps, called catches, that do this. The speed lists are the first good line of defense. You have some poor ones to the aforementioned napkins and fortune cookie slips and envelopes, and blank pages. You also have the pegs too but those require a lot of processing and rotation and can get pretty funky when overused. Back to topic. Your carry about binder. It shouldn't be too thick, not more than 1.5. But it shouldn't be one of those thin things either. You're going to be carrying a lot of stuff in there. What kind of stuff is going to be in there? You're going to have blank papers, say, 30 to 50 sheets. Blank form paper such as pan subject speeds, blank speeds, map pages, and whatever other templated form paper you invent. Bazillion speeds and references speed lists for your myriad subjects. 
some will be accompanied by references lists. Other stuff I personally keep a lot of GTD related materials in there. Perhaps a subject sometimes you carry a subject around from the common store, because you are processing it, or adding new content to it. You won't be carrying all of your subject speeds in there, only the speeds that you are still filling out. For example, if you have 140 speeds in a subject, and the last page of speed starts with S127, then the last page, with S127 S140, is the only speed page that will be in your carry about binder. The rest are back wherever the subject is presently residing probably the common store binder, or maybe in the archives. All of your references go there, however, because you want to be able to give people references quickly. When you talk with people about a subject, show them your list of references, so that you can recommend good references to them. Next notes collected in your common store binder particularly, the notes will be organized into subjects. You'll also have a place called chaos which will be quickly dumped to archive, because it is nearly the most useless thing you will have, though very occasionally used, and a place called unplaced, for pages that are important but haven't been placed, and for pages that would be placed, but that they aren't numerous enough to warrant a full-on subject. You'll indicate the subject that they would belong to at the top. Organize a zip by would be subject. When reach about 5 to 10 pages, Make a full on subject for them, with all that entails. To tight no amari law shoe cow IVB dice tip ton tum tire towel dish tack does tub nose. Yes, I chose dice tip ton, I know, though toes top ten were harder to work with. Chapter 1 Material 12 But mostly, the common store is just the subjects you have been using latterly e the last 20 to 40 days. Occasionally, you'll go through the common store and take subjects out that you haven't touched lately, and put them into it. Lastly notes in the archives. These are big binder that store old subjects that you won't be putting anything into for a while. Start with a Z, split into AM slash NZ, and further as you fill them up. Make sure they have transparent covers and transparent spines that you can put papers into in order to declare their letter ranges quickly. The chaos A subject, a non-subject, should go under C. Dump chaos into the archives frequently. The archives have a second use as well in addition to storing subjects that aren't being used, it is also used as an archival space for subjects that are been used, but have archival content. Some subjects have old junk in them, but old junk that you still want to be able to follow up links to. You mark old junk with a red mark at the bottom of the page. I use the Japanese slash Chinese mark or old, and then you store it at the end of the subject space. We'll talk about this later, in the intra-subject pages, discussing page layout. The archival content is at the back. When you decide to get around to it, you can't take the archival content and throw it into the archive subject. Even though you are still using the majority of the content in the common store binder, or perhaps even carrying it temporarily in your carry about binder. So, queer about done discussing materials, the last topic is handling optimizations. That is, tricks for dealing with papers. I'll talk about papers you are going to throw away, and then I'm going to talk about handling speed lists. Paper you will throw away. Put a gigantic big X over any paper you are throwing away. You don't want to keep running back and forth to the trash. Just start a stack of pages you are throwing out. Put a big X on them as you decide to throw them out. In red, if you can't. If you have a page that you are going to throw away, but are still using, Temporarily, put a dashed X on the page. That signifies to you that the page is on its way out, but still been used. Then, when you are done with it, put a solid X over the dashed X. Speed lists. It is always best to put speed onto the subject page's speed that the speed is going to. Let me make this clearer you do not want to use the pan subject speeds list. Yeah. You don't. Even though we made them because it's another transcription step, and we want to minimize transcriptions. What you want to do is put it on the destination speed list first. The only reason we have the pan subject speed lists is because we don't always have access to the carry around binder, where we are storing the latest speed list for every subject. Chapter 1. Material 13 But when you can't, when you have access to the carry around, put the thought directly into the carry around. Now frequently, You'll be thinking about some subject, 
but thoughts about another subject are also coming to you. What you want to do is to take out those speed lists that thoughts are going to frequently, and you want them close by your side. That way you don't have to go rifling through dozens of speeds. You just have three to seven by your side, and work through those much quicker. Next when you have a big pan subject speed list, with multiple entrees to a single subject, you want to use that to your advantage. You want to check them all off onto the one subject speed list while you are there. Yes, seems like common sense, but I had to figure out a lot of this stuff over time, so I'm telling it to you, even though you may already know, just in case you don't. But remember avoid using the pan subject speeds. And now, having just told you that, I am going to give you another case where you should use pan subject speeds. Sometimes, you are trying very hard to work on one thing, but thoughts just keep coming at you from all angles. But you are trying so hard to stay on one topic, and don't want to deal with all of the maintenance promises. In this case, use the pan subject speeds. Yes, it means more work for you later, but, at least, you get to concentrate on your task at hand and trust that everything is caught into your pan subject speeds. There you are. That is what I have to say here about handling optimizations trash X's pull out speed lists that are frequently accessed during a writing session. Transcribe pan subject speed lists in batch. Avoid pan subject speeds, save when you absolutely need them, either by being unable to carry your carry about binder, or by difficulty concentrating amidst flipping from speed list to speed list. So in recap we talked about raw materials that carry about, common use, and archival binders handling optimizations so you know what I have to say about the materials that the notebook system rests on. Next, I'll talk about general principles that apply across the entire notebook system. Then, we'll go into the intrasubject architecture, followed by the extrasubject architecture. Then I'll talk about the theory of how this all works together. Chapter 1 Materials 14 Finally, for those technophiles out there and you are many, I'll write about the question of computers. Why they suck for what we are trying to do, why it doesn't have to be that way, describe a simple program, that, if written, could alleviate 50 to 90 percent of the burden of this system albeit at a cost, and I'll describe my notion of the ultimate note-keeping computer system. I will also talk in that last section about the versioning problem. The problem that plagues even the existing notebook system, as I have described it, though it is a bit more manageable on paper. Maybe Ted Nelson has solved it. Maybe he hasn't. I don't know. He's not telling us. I do not believe it can be solved. Not in a way that we really like. Chapter 2 General Principles This is a description of some general principles, some general themes, that apply to the entire note-keeping process. 1 information presentation issues page layout petitioning info density page numbers maps to process late binding out cards tolerance for errors starting in the middle divide went big three writing form color quality four psychology five maps we'll start with information presentation issues information density partitioning page layout page numbers 15 chapter 2 General Principles 16 Information Density has to do with how much information we can cram onto one pages. There are times where you are going to want a loose density, and times where you will want very tight density. When you are working with things like mocks, TOCs, or any other form of presenting raw data, then you want to make things as tight as possible. There are many ways of doing this, but one of the best ways is to have a template that helps you write small and cram things together. For example, I have standard form speeds both subject and pan subject that keep 45 lines of text, far more than a college rule. It makes you write small. And it's not just height, when you write small, you write small in width too, so something that once took 3 lines now only takes 2. Information density is at most 4 tables of contents. No double spacing, unless you love flipping pages and scanning with your eyes. You want to be able to see as much as possible in as small a space as possible. On the other hand, there are times where you will want things spaced out. If you are writing in a poise, you'll want to have plenty of room for comments from the future. You'll want to have space to interrupt yourself, or maybe later draw diagrams. You will want less information density. 
so keep these things in mind as you work on your notes. Next Petitioning Partitioning will be a recurrent theme as you keep your notebooks. Let's take the example of a single page. Do you have a space for the title? How big will you want it to be? How about the page number? How much space will you advocate for revision? How about the page's date? Do you want to leave space for that? Content As mentioned in Information Density, you'll want space for future comments. Perhaps you are anticipating a lot of work in the future, so you'll allocate more space for that possible future content. Now let's get off the page and talk about namespace. Whenever you create a system for naming things, you are working in partitioning. You have only so many letters. True, you have infinite glyphs, but they are kind of hard to make indexes out of. They have no intrinsic ordinality, the way letters do. Sometime you may want to reserve a space of page numbers for some particular thing to be filled in in the future. We'll talk about page numbers in a moment. Partitioning is difficult for me to talk about in the abstract, so I just want to leave you with understanding that partitioning is something that I'll be spending some time thinking about. When the particulars of your immediate situation become clearer to you, you'll see what needs to be done. You will have options. The strategies in this book will describe many to you. Over time, you will gain skill in partitioning. Page layout. The last two topics have been pretty vague. Think about info density. Think about partitioning. This one is going to be pretty specific. Chapter 2 General Principles 17 On a given page, you can find the following things Content date title page ID page number sequence identification and archival mark You are probably familiar with the first four. The last two may be a little bit of a mystery to you. The details of the first four content will fill most of your page. I need not explain it. The date goes in the top right corner. It reads something like Sunday, May 25, 2003. I use the Japanese characters for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and Saturday. I highly recommend learning those particular characters. They are not hard, they are very useful, and they look far more different than one another than the letters for Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, etc. You'll be able to mark down the day of the week a lot quicker, and you'll have greater information density. Highly recommended. The title appears at the top of the page, centered. Usually the title will include some sort of identification. For example, the title may read Poise number 26, the Kitty model. The title is the Kitty model. Poise number 26 is the identification for the sequence of pages. This is point of interest number 26. You needn't always have a title, nor need an identification. But it's best to have both. Titles are most important for poise because they delimit the boundaries of the poise. Anything that goes beyond the boundary of a poise point of agreement or title are basically lost, as far as retrieval at a later date goes. That is, if it isn't described by the title, you won't be able to find it. Stay in bounds. Spark new poise when you need to. I'll talk about this more later, when talking about poise. Now we have a page ID. It's a whole topic on its own. So I'll talk about it after I talk about sequence marks and archival marks. For now, let's just say that the page number goes in the bottom right corner, so that you can flip pages and find what you are looking for. Sequence marks. When you create poise number 28, it may consist of one page. It may consist of three pages. It may consist you want to avoid this of 27 pages. But you don't want to have to turn a page to see if there is more material or not. That's a waste of time. So what we have are sequence marks. They effectively say whether there is another page in the sequence or not. As we see when we talk about page IDs, sometimes you can tell just by the page ID. P27, alone, means that there is no next page, that this is a chapter 2. General Principles 18 one cheater. But if it reads P27-1, then you know that this is the first of several. But generally you can't. In the bottom right corner, you put a little glyph, a little arrow pointing to the right, to mean continues on the next page. And if there is nothing on the bottom right corner, that means that you were too busy to put the arrow there, but that you can still, probably go to the next page as well. However, if you see a little box, a little square, drawn in the bottom right corner, then that means that that's the end of the sequence. Unless, unless, 
you might extend the point or whatever sequence it is maybe some research, or a reference, or whatever later, in which case you need to put an arrow through the box. The box is made transparent, so that you can later put something in it to cancel the box. So if you see a box with an arrow on top, that means that once this was the last page of the sequence, but that you later extended it, so turn the page. The sequence mark appears above the page ID. Archival marks. Archival marks appear to the left of the page ID. This is all in the bottom right corner of the page. Now, the archival mark is a red mark unlike the blue page numbers and sequence markers. It can't look like whatever you want. I personally use the Japanese kanji for old. It looks like this. Looks sort of like a tombstone. If you put that mark there, that means that the information on this page is no longer required in the subject, in the common store binder. However, it may still be the target of some links you set up some time long ago, so you want to keep it around. In the archives, not carrying it around with you everywhere. So what you do is point to the most recent information on the page about a note in red saying, see also page ID of more recent information, and then at the very bottom of the page, to the left of the page ID, put your red glyph for archive. Archival pages are in the back part of your section, in terms of physical page layout. Not the very back, that special page is for abbreviations and shorthand. But generally, you throw archival stuff out back. Then when you chapter 2. General principles 19 want to save space, you take all of the archival stuff, and merge it into the archive binders. Finally, page numbers. I use the word page numbers, but I should really be saying page identification, because it's actually much more than a number. Here's are some actual page numbers from my notebooks notebook S27 S47 GP ref 1 II1. 131 Mental Technique P71 P23 The first one means this is a page in the notebook subject, representing speed thoughts numbered 27 to 47. Next this is a page on the global knowledge infrastructure, it's a commentary on reference number 1, in particular it is commentary on sections II and 3 of the document. In the references list, you would see that reference number 1 was towards high performance organizations a strategic role for groupware by Douglas C. and Joe Barr in June 1992. Next this is a page on mental techniques, the first page in point number 7. The last, P23, says nothing more than this is page number 3 of point number 2. How do you know what the subject is? Because it's in the tab personal records. Since you don't move pages around we'll actually talk about that later oh and there are times when you do, see the section on our cards below. There's no need to worry that you won't be able to put it back, unless there's some free disaster such as hitting an economy. Binder the wrong way, pages spill out, and then something happens to also, further, put the pages radically out of order. I've never seen that last part happen. So the parts of a page ID are subject, segment, segment ID, page ID. It's a little different for reference segments, because they adapt to the form of the book that they are commenting but I'm getting ahead of myself. The subject part is optional. You don't have to repeat the subject over on every page. I'd argue that it's not even good to do that, unless you have good reason to believe that your binder is going to explode and all the papers fly out in completely different, unordered, directions. If you fear that kind of thing, put the subject on every single page. Or at least an acronym for the subject. Replace Global Knowledge Infrastructure with GKI. There are places where it'll be good to put the subject on each page, and you'll even want to spell it all the way out. In particular, I am thinking of the speeds pages, and your P and P pages, your latest speeds pages, and your P and P pages, from myriad subjects, will all be living right next to each other. You will need to flip between them, thus necessitating the appearance of the subject name in the page ID. More than that though, you will need the full subject name spelled out because otherwise you are going to have to expand out the full name of the acronym when you are ordering the speeds. Does MDK come before or after MP? Quickly grates on the nerves. This is mental techniques versus metaphysics. Then is number 12, and T is number 19, so MTK does indeed come before MP, even though by chapter 2. General principles 20 acronym, it would appear to go the other way. 
so just spell everything out on your speeds and on your P and P's. After the optional subject is the required segment. The segment signifiers I use, in no particular order, are PJ, Project Poi or P, Point of Interest Rs, Research Ref, Reference A slash S, Abbreviations slash Shorthand P and P, Purpose and Principles I, Index S M O C or M, Subject Map of Contents S, Speed, Thought CHD, Cheat Sheet We'll talk about these segments more in Intersubject Architecture. All you need to know for now, is that there are these segments, and that they have a short identifier, and you'll be sticking that identifier in your page ID. Most common will be S speed Zemp map, or more appropriately, subject map of contents smock P poi, the point of interest, and ref reference. Sometimes I use R rather than ref, but it's problematic because it is easily confused with R's. Research. Quite different things, though similar. Immediately following the segment identifier, you will have a number. That number can mean one of either two things. It can be a TOC number sign, or it can be a version number sign. They are only slightly different. The TOC number means ordinality in the table of contents. Even if you aren't keeping the table of contents yet, there's not much reason to make a table of contents over only two or three points. You still have the notion of ordinality, and that the pieces in the segment are in some sort of addressable order. So that's the first. The second, version number, is when you have things that don't really have a table of contents. Chapter 2. General Principles 21 Consider A slash S abbreviations and shorthand for example. You never have multiple A slash S S. There's just one, the A slash S. Holding all of the abbreviations and shorthands that you use. Ah, but maybe it's getting over stuff. Maybe you've filled out all your hash tables in the A slash S section, so you need to make a new version, A slash S2. You'll copy all of the original A slash S just A slash S, though you can write in a 1 if you like into the new, larger tables, you'll archive A slash S1, and then just use A slash S2. There you go. The same goes for the maps. You usually start with just a single page map, but eventually, you need to scrap it and replace it with four pages of map. So the first map was V1, and the next map is V2. Your first map page was just M, meaning this is a map page, the first map page ever, and there isn't even a sequence for it, it's just a single page. But your next map pages will be M21, M22, M23, M24, denoting their pages within map number 2. You can later expand out with M25, M26, them to seven if you like. And eventually, you'll do a major reorg, and you'll go afresh with M31, M32, M33, and so on. So these are more like version numbers, in this case, rather than TOC entry numbers. Finally, after the subject, segment, and TOC slash version number, you have the page ID. Most of the time, this is straightforward. You start with one, then you go to two, then you go to three, yeah, 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 yeah. But there are two special things to note. 1. It's totally different in the red segment. 2. Sometimes you want to put a page between two existing pages, so you give it a half number or a decimal value. For example, if you want to put two pages between P74 and P75, so what you do is you make P74.3 and P74.7. Hey! There's no binder police. You can do whatever you like as long as it works for you. By the way, I want to briefly comment on that principle. There's no binder police. I'm writing this complex system to you, explaining how I made it up, and how it works. What's most important is that you get the ideas here, not that you actually replicate my entire system exactly. In fact, I hope that you don't. For one, you are living in a different mind than I am. So you are going to probably want to put things in a different way than I do. But more than that, I want to hear new ideas. I want to know what people do with this. And if you just say, hey, I did it exactly like you, well, what growth is there in that? I mean, it might be good for a little while, but I really want to see what else is out there. My system changed in a major way at least once every two to four months. And it was always a positive change. So I want to hear what you all do. And remember there's no binder police, like my girlfriend always chapter 2. General Principles 22 tells me about cooking. 
You want to put paprika in there? Throw paprika in there. There's no cooking police that are going to go after you. So get the meat of what I am saying, the ideas on how you can organize stuff, and then adapt it to your domain. Then tell me about it later. Yeah. I'd be astonished to hear that people are doing this, for one, but to hear that you even carried it forward and tried out new things. That'd just validate my life right there, on the spot. Laugh okay? So where were we? Decimal pages? All's fair in love, war, and binders. Decimal pages if you like. This isn't basic programming, where you have to renumber if you want to put something between line 2 and 3. But references? I have found that it is best to annotate references by using the book's own organization. For example, say a book or web page is organized into three parts I, 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 and three, and those parts are divided into chapters 1, 2, 3, then as you annotate, use that structure. The page ID for comments on chapter 3 of part I, I should begin with I, I, dot 3. At the very end of the book's structure ID, then put your normal page numbers, 1, 2, 3. So for example, if you wrote three pages to go along with I, I, dot 3, they should be ID I, I, dot 3, 1, I, I, dot 3, 2, I, I, dot 3, 3. Or more completely, assuming this is reference number 7, in subject robots robots rest 7 I, I, dot 3, 1. Robots rest 7 I I da 3 2 and robots rest 7 I I da 3 3. And that's that for page numbers and information presentation issues. We talked about page layout, partitioning, info density, and page numbers. Maps are related, but we'll talk about them independently. Next we'll talk about general process principles late binding out cards tolerance for errors starting in the middle divide when big I want to start with my favorite of these tolerance for errors. This is all important. You can't do this and be a perfectionist. Well, okay, it does require some sort of perfectionism to insist on recording and integrating every meaningful thought. But let's ignore that for the moment. I had a good friend in high school. Every day, he would make sure that the entire class's notes fit onto one page. This wasn't done for any good reason, it was just the sort of thing like step on a crack break my mother's back, and chapter 2 general principles 23 you just get into it and can't stop so he write really really small on the page and each page was perfectly identically formatted that will absolutely not work here now suppose you are stuck in this just say then there is a cure what you must do first is realize that the imperfection is imperfect because it is getting in the way of optimal experience of life the second is to intentionally fuck up your page. And you must do it a different, unique, creative way, each time, until you no longer have a phobia of imperfection. Take a big fat pen, of the wrong color, and put a big line down the middle of the page. Or, intentionally, on purpose, completely MISID the page. Say it's a page from another section, another segment. And a TOC entry ID number like infinity or draw a little happy face where the page ID goes. Put yesterday as the date. Or whatever. Just mess it up. On purpose. And then sigh a breath of relaxation. You've screwed the virgin. There's no need to worry now. Similar to this notion of tolerance for errors is starting in the middle. Suppose you have a new idea on how to organize your notebooks. That's good. You want to evolve your system. Most of your ideas will be good. You'll have some bad ones, but all in all, most will be good, and you'll want to encourage the process of evolving. What you don't want to do is go back to your month's worth of previous notes, and adapt them all to the new system. Absolutely not. If you do that, you're going to be stuck forever in your old thoughts, whenever you get a new idea. So the trick is to start in the middle. Just start now with a new system. If you want. You can petition out part of your namespace for a new experiment. Maybe have a segment named X for a while, until you figure out whether you like it or not. Then you can rename it if you like. When devising naming systems, always leave outs if you can. So we talked about tolerance for errors, and starting in the middle. These are process issues we're talking about, again. Now let's go back now and talk about late binding, and out cards. Out cards when you move a page from one place to another place, 
you need to put an out card in the old place. That is, you put a page in the old place at the same page ID as the old place, that points to the new page. That's because sometimes you have links to the old place. You don't know, and you don't care to keep track. If you had bidirection of links all over the place this seems to be one of Ted Nelson's favorite ideas. It would take forever to do you couldn't refer to something without actually divvying it up and then linking chapter 2. General principles 24 back, and you'd have all these irrelevant links all of the place. Sometimes a forward link matters a lot more than knowing that you are linked. Anyways, you don't know if you are linked to or not, or by how many. I suppose you could count, but it seems like a waste of time. The solution is the out card. If you find that a bunch of out cards are next to one another, you can just consolidate them into one, with a wide range page ID. For example, POI 3, pages 4 to 7. Now that we've talked about out cards, it's easier to talk about late binding. Late binding is a common theme in the notebooks. You want to do work that doesn't apply to the present moment, and that might be rendered completely unnecessary, at the latest time possible. The demonstration. You make a page, but later remove it. So you have an out card. Now you move the page again, so you have two out cards. Out card 1 points to out card 2 points to the page. Now, suppose you find a link to out card 1. That's interesting, what's this you find out it goes to out card 2? Curious and curiouser. Finally you find the page. Now, generally, if you follow a link, you are more likely to follow it again in the future. It's a subject for thought and whatnot. So what you do, after looking up the final link, is that you go to out card 1, and correct it to point not to card 2, but to the final destination. And then you go to the original link, and have it not point to card 1, but cross that out and put in the final destination. Yeah. That's late binding. You fix it all up when you actually follow the link, but you don't do that before, because it would just take too long and be too boring to fix up everything beforehand. There's no need. Just do it at the last possible moment. Finally, divide when big. Sometimes a subject gets big. Really big. And as it grows, you start to see dissimilarities where before you didn't. It's a little like Mozart or symphony music. One symphony sounds pretty much like another symphony, if you don't listen to them the whole lot. Oh, there's some classical music playing. But then, as you start to listen, and think about what you are listening to, you'll start to know these distinctions and connections, where you didn't know this them before. And as you do so, you'll see this new structure. That same exact thing happens with the musical stream of thoughts going through your head. The most dramatic example in my case was the fate of two subjects society and metaphysics. I now laughed thinking that I had them as just singular buckets. But I can't really blame myself, because how should I have divided them? Chapter 2 General Principles 25 The subjects are not logically arranged by some sort of cosmic organization. They are arranged subjectively by their own connections in our lives. The process of keeping these notebooks exposes the connections in your mind. They give you a mirror to understand your mind and thoughts. Okay. So what happened to society and metaphysics? They blew up. Society became military. International powers. Meetings. Festivals. Communes. Anarcho-science. Global knowledge infrastructure. Democracy. Social ideologies. Social goals. Electronic collaboration. Activism which later gave way to strategy. Wow. To think, it was all just one subject before and metaphysics. Spirit. Mind first. Admonishment. Ethics. Values. Imagination. Personal identity. So divide went big. It'll help you focus your thoughts. I'll talk a little bit about how to do it in extra subject architecture, talking about how to spawn out subjects from existing subjects. Easier than you think. It's merging subjects that's terrible. But that's pretty rare. Happens but it's rare. So, we've talked about process. We've talked about dividing when big, about tolerating errors, starting in the middle. We've talked about late binding and out cards. This is all process stuff. Before we talking about information presentation, 
like page layout, partitioning, info density, page numbers. We're talking all together about general principles. Next we'll talk about writing form, psychology, and maps. Writing form first. There are two major things to mention here color and quality. And this is where paper and pen really start kicking the computer's ass, and the computer fanatics don't even know it. Discussing quality is really made a lot easier by contrasting it with computers. Actually, a long time ago, I stored all of my thoughts in a computer text file. It was actually an awesome system. The computer has so many advantages that the paper world doesn't. For example, you don't have to put a thought in just one place. You can easily put it into five different places. I call it multi-cat or multiple categorization. It's easy, just put tags. It baffles me to this day why people who make computer notebooks do not do this more frequently. There's all this notebook software out there, and you still have to put a thought in one place, and one place only. They just have a single category tree, and you have to put a thought in a single place. To do otherwise, you have to copy and paste or something. Terrible. Anyways, for all this awesomeness in the computer, you are unconsciously pulled into a problem all of your text looks exactly the same. I mean, let's ignore the obvious problems with including picture. Yeah, like you really want to scan in every single image you make. And like you really chapter 2. General principles 26 want to be so punished for visual thinking, the best thinking. Just consider straight text. In the computer, all of your text is exactly the same. Yes, yes. I can't hear you computer peoples complaining. But you can use fonts. But you can make it bold. But you can make it italics. Yes. 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 I know. You can do all those things. But that doesn't make it fast. In keeping notes, you don't want to constantly be dicking around with your UI. You want to be able to just write. It annoys me enough that to switch pen colors. I have to flip a tab at the top of my pen. But at least I don't have to move my hand away from my pen, or move to a completely different section of the screen to set a font, or move the cursor around. To change fonts for a segment of text, you have to do all that stuff. And you still don't get all of the variation you want. And look there are advantages to having sloppy text. It tells you something about the development of your thoughts. When you see sloppy text, that means this is just a quick idea I span out. When you see regular solid text, that means this is something I thought over for a while. You have your own writing style, and it communicates to you things that are important to you, though you may not consciously register it. Actually, that's good unconscious communication is far stronger, and doesn't get in the way of your thinking. All of this, all of this telegraphing, disappears on a computer. The diagrams, the writing style, all disappears. And considered maps. Maps are basically the backbone of this whole operation that I'm describing. You just can't do it on the computer easily. It takes work on the computer to say, this text is tiny, to give the nuances of positioning, size, quality, all of that stuff. And icons. I use icons all over the place. That's hard to do in the computer. So, by contrasting with the computer, I have described the kinds of things you want to concentrate on in your notebook. Use diagrams everywhere. They are far better than coercive linear text. And use variable writing styles. Write sloppy, write neat, and everything in between. It communicates to you. Use shorthand and abbreviation. No Greg's script. Use that when it suits you. You can late bind decode it later. It's probably not as important as something else. Okay. Enough on that. Now let's talk about color. Your pen has for colors red, green, blue, and black. You will want to connect meeting with each color. Here's my associations red error, warning, correction blue structure, diagram, picture, links, keys in key value pairs green meta, definition, naming, brief annotation, list chapter 2. General principles 27 black main content I also use green to clarify sloppy writing later on. Blue is for keys, black is for values. I hope that's self-explanatory. If you make a correction, put it in red. Page numbers are blue. If you draw a diagram, make it blue. Main content in black. Suppose you make the diagram start with a big blue box. Put the diagram in the box. 
or the other way around. Make the diagram, then the box around it. Put some highlighted content in black. Want to define the word? Use a green callout. Whoops, there's a problem in the drawing. Exit out in red, followed by the correction, in red. Sometimes, I use black and blue to alternate emphasis. Black and blue are the easiest to see. If I'm annotating some text in the future, and the text is black, I'll switch to using blue for content. Or vice versa. Some annotations are red, if they are major corrections. Always remember tolerate errors. If your black has run out, and you don't want to get up right away to fetch your backup pen, then just switch to blue. When the thought's out, go get your backup pen. By the way, I forgot to mention this in the materials section, but it'll do just fine here. Those for color pens, I think they're made in France or something. At any rate, you can swap colors. For example, say that you have one pen, but it ran out of black. So you start using your next pen. But then say that you run out of blue in the new pen. You can open up the pen, pop out the blue, and put it in the newer pen. Yeah. The procedure is difficult to describe. You just have to yank really hard on the ink. Then push it into the new pen's place. It works. It's not advertised, but it works. So there you go. Key value pairs sometimes you have a big hash. For example, in abbreviations lists, you'll have letters A zip running down the left side of the paper. One line may have, say, three key value pairs in it. In my people abbreviations, for example, under MNO, I have Mount, Fancy, NH, Me. Those letters are written in blue, because they are keys. The values, written in black, are Michael Turner, Noam Chomsky, Napoleon Hill, and Michael and. Quite an interesting collection of people, no? That's why they get to be two litter people. Smile next, the psychology of notebooks. I want to talk about being excited, stewing, and the kitty model. All three very different things, but all about the psychological aspects of notebooks. Being excited Be excited about keeping your notes. Imagine what can come of it. Experience the vision. You are building clarity. You are organizing all of your thoughts together, and seeing what it adds up to. The results will surprise you, and you will see things that you have never seen before. Next Avoid Stewing Chapter 2 General Principles 28 Stewing is what I call it when you are just loading over your notebook, putting things in, maintaining it, and being overall pretty directionless. Just watching connections form. I suppose it's alright for a little while, and that it has its uses. You certainly have to do a degree of processing as you keep your notes. But if you just found out that you spent three hours stewing over your notebook, you want to, and can, avoid that. Focus on the priority tabs, and decide on thoughts to calculate out. You have problems in your thoughts figure out solutions. Go for major notions per minute, don't get so bogged down in details. Finally the kitty model. So called because my girlfriend's name is Kitty. I really want to just scan in the page that she made and that I included in my notebooks. However, our scanner has broken for the third time, and we really think it's dead now, so, I'll just have to tell you what the kitty model page depicts. Words in parenthesis are either cartoon images or kanji. I am lion. Kitty is my girlfriend. Kitten is our daughter. I should introduce you to my family. Amber is my girlfriend. Our daughter's name is Sakura. Straight from Notebooks P26, Poi Backslash Number 26, The Kitty Model, Monday, May 26, 2003, Lion O. I think to think. Lion writes, think down. Ten years later, Lion, how will I develop all these things? Two stacks of notes. One at a time, I guess. Kitten, Daddy. Lion, a page. Okay, this is a good think. Let's develop it a bit. Kitten, Daddy, I'm getting married. Lion, Oh shit. I got another think. Ten years later, kitten lion for stacks of notes. Daddy. Ship. I have all my thinks written down. Grave marker, lion kitty bonfire, lion's thinks. Chapter 2. General Principles 29 P26. Note the page ID in the bottom right corner, the title on the top, the date in the top right corner, and the page contents in the middle. This cartoon speaks for itself. Particularly, 
on the immobilizing features of the notebook system, and the perils involved here. Contemplate deeply on this image. Otherwise, you may find yourself in very dangerous territory. I'm fucking serious. If you don't worry about this, then you are going into major spiritual self-damage. If you don't believe in that kind of thing, then consider damage in terms of however you contemplate your life. But it can be really bad to do this for long periods of time. I'm not saying it isn't a good idea to do this for a little while, or even periodically. But you don't want to do this for much longer than a few months at a time. Unless you are a monk. In which case, go for it. Equals let me know how it goes. Finally, I want to talk about maps. They are so critically important to this whole thing. Because they are the assembly points. That's where all of your thoughts come together into one place. Your point, your speeds, your research, your references, just everything. You assemble it all together on the map. And the map you construct, that map is far more important than the sum of the content of all of your thoughts. Because, with that map, you can reconstruct the whole thing. Take this book, for instance. What I've basically done, is taken my two map pages from my notebook's notebook, and I'm just going over the maps I have. Sit so realizing them out into text. For example, on general principles, there's a link to psychology, with 0.33.37 p26 next to it. In green, next to p26, it reads the kitty model. Can you guess what 0.33 and 0.37 are about? They're about being excited, and about not stewing. If I had put under 0.33 the word, in green, excited, and under 0.37 don't stew, I wouldn't even need my speed lists. I could just reconstruct the whole thing for you here in text, based on the map. So there is that. Now I want to talk about constructing maps, in the particular. For this, I'm going over to my visual language notes and looking at the SMOC, pulling out the section on maps. And there I have it multi-dimensional mocks, possibilities, in explanations, and why better? Chapter 2 General Principles 30 For the sake of writing this book, I'm going to skip the possibilities of mapping, and explanations, and focus in on multi-dimensional maps, and maps the are better than TOCs in most cases. I'm demonstrating this to you, so that you can see, as I go with this, how they work. I see off in the distance mental coercion. It's its own topic, within this SMOC for visual language VL smock. The big things in this area are maps and mental coercion. Between them is the white better field. Surrounding them are uncoercive which itself links to mental coercion, structure which links to the hypertext movement, enables strategy, and only read new ideas. Those things are written in tiny little lowercase letters and the are surrounded by lots of little dots with small numbers by them, references to the VL speed lists. And before we go much further yes, I do realize the irony here. Yes, I do realize that my writing here is terrible. I'm not a writer. And yes, I realize that this should be written as a hypertext. And yes, I realize that for being such a strong proponent for visual language, that this document should be visual. And yes, I realize that it should be mapped out rather than a big long didactic mentally coercive text. Yes, I realize all of these things. But I also know that my computer skills of actually inputting those things, are actually pretty poor. I'm a great programmer, but I don't know how to use Photoshop. And the tools out there are pretty poor for the kinds of things I am describing. And I realize that if I try to write in those ways, that this book will never appear on the internet. And I further realize that there is near zero content on the internet that has to do with the kinds of things I am describing. So, in conclusion, I say better a little than none at all. I only believe that, if you are actually reading this, if there is one person in the world interested in this subject, that you will be grateful that this work appears, even in this ultra crummy form. Yes, I have talked with people who have read my entire weird file speakeasy.org lion slash weird html, so, I believe people will read this. And that someone may even follow the directions and do something like this themselves. Please contact me if you do. I may I would say will, but I don't really know for sure make a second draft of this document. Whoa! Concept? And if I did, I would put it in docbook. Then you'd at least have a table of contents 
and organized pages as much as I hate tables of contents for their weaknesses. And I may even scan in pictures and diagrams from my notebooks, and if I do, the text would become incredibly more clear and accessible. And it is conceivable, that, in the distant future, I would put together this all in a matte, hypertext, by Kong including set of pages. It would be a lot of work, but I could go that far. If people were interested. Chapter 2 General Principles 31 So the lesson is if you are slaving through this, if there is a single soul out there actually reading this you must let me know. It is a moral imperative. Thank you. Back to maps, from irony. I want to write about why maps are better, and about how to frame the first page of a bunch of map pages. I also want to write about creation techniques. Maps are better than TOCs because they are mentally uncoercive. They reveal structure in ways mocks cannot. They enable strategy. Incredible useful subtlety mental coercion. Let me describe this idea for a moment. Think about a Shakespeare play. Now think of a map of, say, the Earth. The Shakespeare play is mentally coercive. To get it, you have to go through the whole thing, start to finish. You can't watch it backwards, and get the same thing. It's possible, but difficult to just look at portions of threads that interest you, without significantly processing other sections. You have to skip a lot, if you want to do that. Now contrast that with a globe. If you are interested in a particular thing, you can just go straight to that thing. Focus in on the state of Washington, or whatever have you. In your mind, the rest of the globe disappears. You're just looking at Washington, and Canada, and Oregon, and whatnot. Yes. I am a CNN Seattleite. Anything north of the border is just Canada. Could be Quake, BC, what are those things? It's all just Canada, to my untrained ear. No cruelty intended. Apologies to the rest of the world for the incredible harm our country inflicts. That's what I mean when I talk about mental coercion. It is my opinion that most books textbooks in particular are unnecessarily mentally coercive. I believe that you could also write fiction that was not mentally coercive, and still get around but do they understand the build-up? Problems that hypertext fictions have. But I am not here to talk about hypertext fiction, I am here to talk about maps right now. So one maps are mentally uncoercive. Much of the remaining advantages are based on this. Next maps reveal structure. Maps reveal structure in ways that TOCs, by nature of their forced ordinality, cannot how could I possibly represent the links from map, to why better, uncoercive, mental coercion in the TOC? Both map and mental coercion are high-level constructs. Chapter 2 General Principles 32 Can I imagine I map 1? Why better 2? Uncoercive I I Mental coercion, not only does it not work, but uncoercive should be connected beneath why better, and we're also screwed up because as soon as we put in item 3, the link is broken between uncoercive and mental coercion. No, that's all wrong. I am convinced that the only reason that we do TOCs is because we just haven't built the tools to make maps. We are being beat up by the constraints of our medium of expression. Fortunately, this will all change in the future. Scott MC Cloud and Robert Horn etc. all are hard at work at correcting this mistake, now that we have the computers that can express what we really want. Complex structure cannot be represented by a TOC. It can only be represented by a map. Even then, there are still problems, for example, non graphical interconnections, but we are still light years beyond the TOC. Next maps enable strategy. You can zoom in on precisely what you want to read. To be strategic, you need context. Without context, you cannot make strategic decisions. With a TOC, you are limited to two pieces of context what's above, and what's below. Actually, you also get to go back an indentation level, and you can also look at children of a super topic. So that's two more. So you are confined to a grid. But we don't want that. We want to be able to go every which way, in order to more fully see the context, the terrain, so that we can make strategic decisions about what to read, or what to write. Finally you have the possibility of incredible subtlety. I'm not talking useless but this is so incredibly subtle, you will never even get it. I mean, that you can position things, precisely, in order to make statements that require no words. 
This goes back to the sort of unconscious communication idea I mentioned. It's best when you can't communicate complex ideas, without even speaking the word, and people just get it. What am I talking about here? I'm talking about how you can position ideas that are related close to one another, and you don't even have to assign a label to the group of ideas. Or you can position one idea right smack dab between two other ideas, if there is a relationship between them. And people will get it. People can figure out what you can mean. And even if you don't draw a line between them, people will pick it up. This blends into my next topic, which is constructing maps. When you create a map, as per my system, you have two basic types of materials. You have your links, hard content that is, your speeds, your points, your references, your whatever. Even other maps. Everything you keep in your subject, appears as hard content on your map. Then you have your magnets. These are the words that pull on the hard content. They build your structure. Chapter 2. General Principles 33 Here's an example from my notebooks, particularly PFD, Public Field Technologies. I wanted to make a map of what PFD meant to me. I made a big list of all of the Public Field Technologies 1, Visual Verbal Language 2, Self-Help Books 3, Personal Notebooks 4, Home Organizing 5, Community 6, Co-ops 7, Communes 8, Community Dollar Networks 9, Free Software Debt Practices 10, Community Democratic Self-Rule 11, Babysitting Networks 12, Community Public Papers 13, Community Wireless Networks 14, Festivals that involve participants 15, Tool Share Networks 16, Activist EDU Networks 17, Open Space Technology Host 18, Social Blueprints 19, Social Identity Organizing Blueprints 20, Group Help Books 21, Arguments Databases 22, Collaborative Mapping 23, Group Wear 24, Wiki 25, Anarcho Science 26, Collaboration Techniques and Study 27, Field Advancement Study 28, Visual Facilitation 29, Public Field Technology Self Study 30, Open Hyper Document System OHS That's a list of what I call Public Field Technologies. But I don't want to get lost talking about it all right now. The focus is on the mapping process right now. First that was just an unnumbered list. Then I numbered it. 1 to 30. Then I started to look for patterns. I tried a few ways, and then I realized that I could handle a substantial number of the items by making a scale from individual, to family, to clan slash tight community, to lose community, to global. Yeah. So 2 and 3 self-help books, personal notebooks this. Those are on the individual end of the scale. Then on family, there's home organizing. You don't want to actually write out home organizing, because it's a lot of space, and a lot of writing. You just want to put four on the map. That way, if you decide to move it later on, you just cross out the fourth, and put it somewhere else. Much easier. Much more agile. Once it's all solidified and you are happy with it, you can turn on the green, and expand out the numbers. But for now, you want just numbers out there. So the word individual appears pretty big, on the page. That's a magnet word. It's attracting to and three to itself. They are right next to it. Now let me point out something interesting 10 is community democratic rule. Where did I put that? It's not attached directly to a magnet word. Actually, it appears between two magnet words clan tight community, and loose community. Clan slash tight community has, immediately connected to it, six co-opus and seven commune and loose community has connected to it 5 community local, 14 festivals involving participants. Interestingly enough, it also has some magnet words on its sides, community communications line W-12 and 13 attached and community resource collection W-811 and 15 attached. But democratic self-rule, number 10, floats between them. Chapter 2 General Principles 34 So this is an example of some of the subtlety that makes allowed that TOCs do not, and how they work out. Yeah. Incidentally, for those who wonder the line from individual, global was just one half. The other half is centered around collaboration, and communication itself visual verbal language. So there you are. You should be able to map things now, at least crudely. Your skill will increase with practice.
Now I want to talk about what to do when maps get big, and multiple categorization of maps. When maps get big, you want to rebuild them, and have a distant view. You also want to respect multiple categorization. Frequently, there are three ways of looking at the same thing, and you will want to capture all of them. The first map in a sequence of maps should be a map of maps. Oh, by the way, yes, you can have icons and pictures and smiley faces on your maps. There are no map making police. You can do it however you like. Once so have a map of maps at the beginning. And have super maps as you need the maps that give you a bird's eye view of other maps. And have teleporters and warps from map to map. Really, you can do whatever you want. To a hem. So, you now know why maps are cool, and how to make them. You won't just make them in your SMOC and Jizmok, you may also make use of them in your poise, as I did with the PFD map. And we're done with this section. We've discussed the general principles. A brief rehash information presentation page layout, partitioning, density, page numbers process late bind out card, errors, start middle, divide when big writing color, quality psychology the kitty model maps one eye kind of light Tony Buzin. I kind of don't. I think that his rules are a bit constrictive. Why must you use millions of colors? Why must you draw them like that? I don't want to. I think it's a waste of time. And I want to draw the maps how I want to. I don't find your way particularly perfect or anything like that. And I don't think that the ability to draw maps requires certification or anything like that. Okay. I have too much of an anarchist in me. Drawing power for the people. Much more a Mark Kistler guy. Draw3d.com. Yeah. You're all creative geniuses. Yeah. Okay, I'm done. Two, I swear. I have just been touched by the spirit of Mark Kistler, by the mere thought of the man. Or L'Associate Libra. I swear, that man wears too much black and red, and that big red and black star. The raised fist holding a pen. His insistence on the intrinsic value of people. HMM, Chapter 2. General Principles 35 Next, we'll talk about the architecture within a subject. Then we'll talk about the super architecture. Binding all of the subjects together. Then a bit about the theory of notebooks, and finally, the question of computers. Chapter 3 Intrasubject Architecture Within a subject, you have a large collection of papers. They have a logical organization into segments, and a physical organization the sequence of papers. The major segments are P and P, purpose and principle speeds, speed thoughts SMOC, subject map of contents poise, point of interest studies HARS, research ref, Reference PJ, Project I, Index CHD, Cheat Sheets A slash S, Abbreviations, Shorthand X, Experimental, Temporary Unlinkable. At least, those are the major segments I have hammered out well. There are more segments that I would like to practice, Formalize SEP, Chronological Episode TV, Topical Deliberation TV, Data Dictionary Definitions 36 Chapter 3. Intrasubject architecture 37 liters slash T, lists and tables high info density something to recognize here is that you can make up whatever you like. However, you don't want to just make up a new thing every time you have a new thought or format. You want to think about your divisions, and create new ones sparingly. If you can't fit something into an old one, and nothing suffers, then preserve the old situation. It's only when you have something really new, that is best served by a new category that you will do well. I haven't studied and thought out the details of why this is the case, it is just something that I happen to know this. With practice, you can flesh this out. One day, you can write a great explanation on how it works, and we can consolidate everything into one huge glorious document. Now, you don't have to have all these segments. Remember late bind, late bind, late bind. Only build what you have to when you need it. I should add here also that, for many of these, you'll want to make TOCs for them. When you start a subject, you know, you've collected a few pages in the unplaced, all with the same subject marker. And after it reaches about 5 to 10 pages, you say, well, let's make this into a full-on subject now. So your subject starts with roughly 5 to 10 pages. You don't have to start writing a POI TOC if you only have to actual POI. 
Wait until you actually could use a poi before you write one. After you have about 10 poi, then make a poi toc. Late bind. So we have segments. What else do we have in the subject? We have the physical organization to talk about as well, the way papers are physically laid out, from front to back. It is the shorter topic, so I'll describe it immediately. Physical layout title layer the subjects tab page SMOC, subject map lookup layer S, speeds TOCs, tables of contents I, index contents just about everything else archival store quick access CHV, cheat sheets A slash S, abbreviations note the P and P page does not go in the subject. The P and P pages, one for each subject, are collected into a grand P and P collection area. More on this in the extra subject architecture. That is you start with the actual tab page, that delimits the subject in your notebook. You know, it's a big yellow flash tan sheet, it has a plastic tag sticking of the edge, and you slip a little paper in. On that little paper you slip in, you place the name of the subject. Simple as that. Your subject starts with that. Then you have the SMOC, this may be one page, it may be many pages. If you have many pages, the first one should be the page that points to the rest of the mock pages, or presents your super map, or whatever. By the way, SMOC means subject map of contents. That is, it's a mock that applies over a subject, rather than a just mock, which we'll talk about in extra subject architecture. Chapter 3 Intra subject architecture 38 Following the SMOC, you store your speed thoughts. Now realize, you will be missing some of your speeds. The latest ones, in fact, because you are carrying those around with you, in your carry about binder. But most of the time you are dealing with your subjects, you'll be in your common store binder, or maybe even in an archive binder. But the speeds that are not on the latest page, you will store right after the SMOC. Why? Because your SMOC will refer intensively to your speeds. You'll have little 28S and 33S that you are going to want to collapse by using the speed lists. You don't want to have to fish around into the middle of your binder, looking for the speeds. So put them right after the mock. If you are in the process of doing a lot of work with a particular map, you're just going to want to open up the binder, pull out your speeds, close the binder, and work with the pages side by side. So immediately after the mock is a convenient place. Then, you follow the older speeds with the TOCs the table of contents for the rest of the stuff. Again, for similar reasons, you'll have 5 or P5, however you choose to notate it, on your map. And you're going to not want to go fishing through the contents of your subject. You're going to want to just glance at the TOC, and see that POI5 is about naming, or whatever. BDW, after you perform a lookup on a map, and you are pretty sure the item won't be moving around a bunch, switch your pen into green and write a one to three word description slash mnemonic next to the link on the map. Ah, there's a very special TOC, that is, your references list. References can be either expanded, meaning that you've actually gone to the work of analyzing them on paper, or not expanded, meaning you just keep a reference to it, so that you can write bibliographies, or refer it to friends, and whatnot. Remember that reference page numbering partially adopts the actual references structure. So, the actual reference pages serve double as a TOC. Sadly, the pages can be in only one place at a given time. I keep them in the carry about binder, immediately coupled with the latest speed list, so that I have it on hand to cite to friends who are interested in something I am talking about. It also helps in libraries and bookstores when I decide to make good use of my time by looking things up. More on references later. The point is the references pages are a special form of TOC over your reference analysis. Consideration. Now what order do you put your TOCs in? Put them in alphabetical expanded, not abbreviated order. Let's suppose you have for research entries, two expanded references, 13 points, and one project. Research reference point of interest project chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 39, alphabetically 1. Point of interest. POI 2. Project, PR 3. Reference, Red for. Research, ARS after the TOCs, you place your index. I'll describe it later, but for now it's basically an AZ-123 slash symbol mapping from a subject, 
to all of the resources you have on that subject. It's late bound, that is, it isn't current. Maintaining a current index would take forever, and you'd only use some parts of it anyways. Maintaining it would be a constant interruption. Bad bad bad. What you do is, whenever you find yourself flipping through your notebook looking for all occurrences of a subject, a minor subject, since major subjects already appear nicely on your mock, then you cache your results onto the index page. More on it later. After the index, you have pretty much everything else that hasn't been already described. How do you organize it? The same way you organize the TOC alphabetically, by full expansion. If you have three references, say Ref 3, Ref 9, and Ref 21, then they should obviously appear in the order Ref 3, Ref 9, and Ref 21, numerically. After you have placed everything else, then you have the archives. Archival pages are the ones with the red glyph at the bottom denoting an archival page. You organize all archival pages in alphabetical order, based on segment. Yes, all of them. Even including your NAPs, TOCs, and indexes, A slash SS, whatever. It all goes in alphabetical order, when it comes to the archives. Do remember when your archival section grows unwieldy, or if you just want to get rid of it, you can pull all those pages out and merge them into the archival binders place for the section. Finally, you have your cheat sheets, and at the very back, your abbreviations slash shorthands lists. Remember that the easiest places to reach within your subject are the very front, and, the very back. So we keep important, frequently used things there. The very front is the most important map of all of your maps, and the very back is your most frequently accessed abbreviation sheet. You should be using abbreviations, lots of them. Unfortunately, I haven't written much on abbreviations, but there's a reason for that many people have already written a lot on the internet on the subject. Look it up on the internet. If you want to get really wild, use Chinese slash Japanese kanji, or use Greg script. Best use of visual languages iconography. So, that, in short, is the paper layout. Chapter 3 Intrasubject Architecture 40 Now, let's talk about the individual segments themselves. Then we'll talk about some of the experimental segments. Purpose and Principles The PNP is unique in that it has zero presence in the actual subject pages, unless it is an old version in the archival pages. The purpose of the PNP is to determine what goes in the subject, and what goes out. It describes the boundary of the subject. If it turns out that something goes out of the subject, the PNP page also gives you some hints on where to send it. There are two ways that I have denoted PNP pages. The old way is to take a page in half, make the top have includes, and the bottom half excludes. Form, subject name PNP date include inclusion inclusion exception inclusion the XCL exclusion target exception exclusion target exclusion target subject name PNP verb backslash number sign. Here's an example from my books. Personal psychology PNP no date include clearly psychological forces self-image motivation feelings self-help techniques chapter 3 intersubject architecture 41 next cl non-mechanical forces mp national forces mp very broad modeling of my life mp gender studies social i am i am gn values goals values acts functional details acts interpersonal psychology ppl though focus techniques MDK Personal Psychology PNP. Let's note something first though, this page is out of date. So as a demonstration of lay binding, let me fix this now. MP, that is, metaphysics, was blown up a while back. I don't think many of these redirects are correct now. What is pointing to MP? Non-mechanical forces, national forces, and very broad modeling of my life. I know right off that very broad modeling of my life should go into personal history. Switch the pen to red, cross out MP, and replace it with fist. How about national forces and non-mechanical forces? Those do belong in metaphysics. Just to be sure, though, I check the Jizmok, and see if the ideas would rather gravitate elsewhere. The Jizmok suggests proximity to spirit, values, imagination, personal identity, no, it's none of those. So we'll keep it in MP for now. If there are enough related thoughts in MP, these subjects may break out, 
be ejected from MP, but for now, they'll live in there. The closest is spirit, the purpose of which is explained in the spirit and awareness P and P page, but glancing at the page makes it clear that the ideas don't fit in there. MP it is. So that's how P and P works. It tells you what to include, and what to exclude. And the things excluded, it tells you where else to put them. Or maybe not. If there is no such place yet, just leave the target blank. There's another way to do P and P, that is to make a diagram. You put a large circle in the center with the P and P's subject. Then you draw lines out towards representing other subjects. What is included goes center ward. What is excluded goes to the extremities, to the subjects that are their actual target. When inclusion and exclusion are along an axis, the axis takes the form of a line, with subjects at either end. Put the exclusion slash inclusion specification at the ends of the line. That way you can visually see how to cut topics. There is usually only a single P and P page per subject. I have never seen one grow beyond one page. Now you understand P and P Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 42 Next Speeds Your Speed Thoughts Pages are ideally built by a computer. When I get around to putting this online, I'll also place the Word documents that include my templates. Remember we want info density for our speed thoughts. Pack as many onto a page as you can. The format of a speed thought page looks like this. Subject name SSV number sign hint at content and so on. Subject name SS. A bit of explanation is in order. The V is some sort of glyph that means checked off. I use a downward pointing arrow, but you could just as well have a check mark, or just a dot, or whatever. That column means whether the given speed has been mapped or not. You'll collect speed thoughts quickly, probably faster than you can map them. Every now and then, you'll go over your speed thoughts and map them preferably from most recent to oldest. Most recent tends to be more immediately relevant and worthy of thought. You can go in any order that you want, but you want to keep track of what you've mapped and what you haven't. The number sign column is where you number the speed thought. If it's speed number 47, the number 47 should appear here. On the first row line of the speed, the three line speed has the number appear only in the first row, the rest, leave blank. Note when you are mapping speeds onto the map, you're going to want to do it like this 47. Just a single dot, to denote the 47 refers to a speed thought. Speed thoughts will, by far, populate the integrated mock. It'll look like constellations, lots of little black speed map stars with blue structural lines and magnet words revealing the underlying structure of your thought. Believe me, it's beautiful when you see it all done out. Next comes the hint. The hint is a one to three word description of the context that the speed thought lives in. This is major important. Why is it so important? Because when you are mapping your speed thoughts, you don't want to have to keep recognizing the content of the thought, you want to just put the thought where it goes. Thus the aid of the context hint. Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 43 Next comes a funny little at sign column. Actually, I use the character side. You can omit this column if you want. I use it to provide some information on what type of thought it is. This connects into something I call icons for thought, and it's part of my MBK mental technique notes. I'm not going to describe the system here. This is a book about notebooks. Maybe someday I'll write about it. A brief description will do though some thoughts are problems, goals, questions, or incentives. Some are starting points. Some are requests to analyze, to pick apart, and some are requests to articulate. Some are notes on maps, some are rules or principles, some are names or borders. Some are see also but not references, which go in ref, some are quotations, some are hazards or rebounds. There are many variety of types of thoughts. Free free to skip that column. Lastly, there is the content. Sometimes, you'll just put a word in there, or maybe two words. Sometimes, you'll fill three rows of content. Put in what you are comfortable with. Lean toward the terse, away from the verbose. Use abbreviations and shorthand. You can use the speed lists as a to-do sheet as well, maintenance events that you want to see show up later. Check them off in the first column when you complete them. Again, there are no speed thought police. You can lay out whatever you want. Add columns, 
subtract columns. Whatever you do, let me know about it, or let the world know about it somehow. I want notebook creation to be a creative science, after all, your thoughts and experiences matter. Now, I've presented the description of the speed page, but I also want to talk about some issues connected with speed thoughts here. Can subject speed thought lists growth process memento, speed, articulation completing the speed remember that there are can subject speed thoughts. The page and form for a pan subject speeds page looks exactly the same, except that instead of number sign, you have subject, where you tell what subject's speed list is the target. And instead of checking off when you've mapped it, you check off when you've transcribed the speed thought to the appropriate speed list. Next when you are recording speed thoughts, there is a sort of growth process, a scale of articulation. Zero. The idea 0 0.2. Repeating in your mind. 0 0.5 page 1 memento to speed 3 articulation first you have an idea in your head you might repeat it in your mind to not lose it you might add it to a peg list and review it periodically until you have access to paper chapter 3 intersubject architecture 44 there are strategies for holding thoughts in your head very briefly take the thought reduce it to a short few syllable word as you pack in thoughts, cycle through the words. When you unpack, unpack only a single word first, for each item, until you have them all out. Then go over the list again, adding a second word. After you have two words out, you're pretty safe. Then add a third. Now you're solid. Now go over the list and give a single line description. Don't start with two words, just go parallel, striping one word first, then the second, then the third. Then you are safe. Your one to three word description is what I call a memento. Then if you expand it out a bit, I call it the speed. One to five lines, tops. Anything more, and you should probably be writing a poet entry, or some other articulation. The speed lists should contain mementos and speeds. So, you have a view of where the speeds fit in the scale of an idea to full on articulation. Most thoughts are best left at stage one or two. Just place them on the map, and check them off. Some thoughts, however, you will need to delve into. Be sure to do so strategically. When I talk about mocks, I'll talk about strategy. If I forget to, mail me and let me know. Using strategy, you can figure out what to articulate and what to leave unexpanded. Yes, I'd use a speed list to maintain these promises, but hey, I'm going to build that list later. I am an experienced notekeeper, not an experienced book writer. I'm aiming for raw content right now. In future book experiments, I'll try other stuff. Right now, I'm just racing to the end. What more? Ah, speeds to completion. You want to eventually be done with a speed thought. Generally, the speed thought is done when it's mapped. What happens when the map is fundamentally changed? You move to a new map version. Well, when you redo maps, you want to lose as little information as you can. You will invariably lose some, because your old ways of looking at things are frequently wrong, or deficient in some way. If you like, you can mark a red check into the speeds box when it is retired. I personally haven't done this. If you put red checks in all of the boxes, check the archive box at the bottom of the page, and you can safely put the speed list in archive. I find it best to look forward rather than look backward, in the notebooks. Psychology note. Thoughts die. That is good. They are reborn, symbolically, in your new map structure. Is there anything else I want to say about speeds? I once thought it would be a good idea to take speeds that were taken off the map, and transfer them back to the speed list. That is, white out its checked box. As I said above, I think it's best to just let them die. We want to forget old thoughts. And as Michael Ann likes to point out, that something has entered our mind and then been forgotten, it still leaves a trace on us, in our unconscious. I agree with Michael and Let it go. That thought has Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 45 helped you, carried you forward. It contributed to helping you recognize a new map, a new order. Its time is done now. There. I have said what I want about speeds. I'll talk about how they can navigate over maps in the maps section. 
which is coming right up. SMOC a subject map of contents. In the general principles chapter of this book, I already wrote a lot about SMOC. I want to fill in some holes here. Now, in particular, I want to talk about page layout strategy trickling speeds over the map icons transitioning maps that is, I want to write about how a page is laid out, how to use the SMOC to make strategic decisions, how to trickle speeds and other entries, but mostly speeds. Over the map, icons on the map, and transitioning from an old map structure to a new map structure. The map has a simple page layout, map title creation date freeze date. Once frozen your content here subject SMOCV backslash number sign, page backslash number sign, I'm not going to write about what map content looks like, go back to the maps section in general principles to learn about that. I'm going to talk about specifics in SMOC pages here. The creation date, list the first. That's when you make the map. Once you retire the map, you give a freeze date. That's when the map is done. Check the archive box at the bottom. 2. Next strategy. Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 46. After you accumulate, say, 20 speeds, a point or two, and a few references, and whatever else you have, it's time to get a good overhead view of your thoughts on your subject. That will both suggest places for thinking to plug in holes, and show you the boundaries of your thought, so that you can expand those boundaries. Almost always, when you complete the map, You'll suddenly have an avalanche of thoughts, not just immediately, but over the next few days as well. Your mind, upon seeing the structure, will suddenly have a ground to go further from. You've turned on the lights in the present room, and can't now find the door to continue to the next. Now your map is 2D, but time flows linearly. You need a path of progress. What you do is this you take out all those little sticky tags that I told you to buy in the materials part. They are about one half wide, at most, and maybe one fourth tall. You pick the subjects and locations that need the most work, somewhere between one to ten of them. You write red words onto one to ten of your sticky tags, describing the work to do. Then you place the red tags onto the map. Those are your options. Those are the places where you should likely devote your attention. As discussed in the theory section of this book next to last chapter, the source of input to your notebooks isn't the speed lists, the source of input to your notebooks is your attention, which then produces speed lists. Now a note about these strategy tabs. You don't have to wait for a remapping effort to make these. Anytime you have a thought about what to work on, you can make a sticky, and put it on your map. If there is no place on the map for it, just put it out loading in space on the map. That's just fine. You'll map it out later. And as things become unimportant to you happens a lot, just take tabs off. Throw them away. If you want to remember to put a tab on, but you aren't there at the moment, just put onto your speed list, number 43 blah blah remember to work on blah blah. Then when you are processing your speeds, and you see that, if it is still important to you, check off the speed, make a red sticky, and put it on the map in the right place. The speeds don't just catch ideas. They also catch work requests. Remember that. So, where were we? I want you to leave this strategy session with this in mind. You have your sticky tabs. You stick them onto the map, to indicate where work needs to be done. You take them off when you they become irrelevant to you, or when you complete whatever issue it is. Then you just throw the little sticky in the trash. Its work is done. You do not want to write priorities on the map. The priorities change very frequently. They should be going on and off pretty frequently. You'll chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 47 mess up your map if you keep writing all over it. No need to replace it that often. Anything else I need to say here? One last thing this really belongs in the extra subject architecture, but it's related, so I will describe it here. You may take off one sticky, the most important one to you at the moment, and stick it on the Jizmok. I haven't described the Jizmok yet. But for now, just know it is a map of all of your subjects. That way, when you are poring over all of your subjects, you'll see what is the most important first thing to think about in that subject. At least, what you thought was most important the last time you were in there. Things change quickly. And also try to keep only one sticky per strategy idea.
try to avoid keeping copies at multiple levels. I tried multiple levels once, and it just became a maintenance nuisance. Whenever you have multiple levels, just take one item from the lower level, take it off of the lower level, and stick it onto the higher level. Have only one higher level item for each lower level island that exists. Now I'm done talking about strategy. So, we've talked about the simple page layout, we've talked about strateginax, we talked about trickling speeds over maps. Okay so you have a big list of speeds, and an empty map? You make a new map version. Suppose you were on map number 1. But you have 100 speeds, and map number 1 is getting old. Now you are making map number 2. Let's suppose, actually, that you need a temporary map, a scratch map. The wise idea, because you might make mistakes, no. And you'll want to correct them. What should you number the scratch map? Or should you keep it at all? I say yes. You should number it number 2. Not 1.5, and don't throw it in the trash. Just call the scratch map M2. Then when you make the real map, label is M3. That's totally okay. And besides, I've been surprised by how many times the scratch map ends up being the real map. And you are going to be interrupted sometimes, too. So just treat the scratch map as a real map and don't be afraid of growing numbers. We have a versioning system. Use it. So you have either no map you are making the first one, or you have a poor one, and you have a big list of unmapped speeds. The procedure is as follows 1. Take an idea off the speed list, preferably from the bottom. 2. Think, how do I think about this idea, in terms of structure? 3. Build missing structure, if it isn't there. Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 484. Put the speed dot on there. 5. Check off the speed dot. 6. Are all speeds done? Or are we satisfied? Or are we interrupted? If no, go to 1. Here's an example. Here's a speed list electronic collaboration number sign hint content. One structured email should people structure their email. X name SYSF titles. One email flash topic address. Breath to struct considered harmful. Two wiki, populating can't just have wiki, must have PPL to populate it, or pop yourself. PPL head later. Note opposes if build, will come. Some will, but few, in my experience. Three map software. Collab make flash chg map of subject. Reps platinum to webpage, books, individuals, orgs, articles, diff sizes, colors, fonts. Also big changes affect many should be PSBL, for wiki, canonicalizing ways make changes, harden w flash time, 5 software map keeps research map, to decollab and maintain, PPL submit refs for include, vote, pass equals good, fail apply elsewhere, correct xyz, mark spam, book, wp, ppr, project, looking at the hints, we see we are talking about email structures, wiki, mapping software. But there are other ways to cut this as well. What structures does this suggest? First, let's take the obvious ones types of software. Wiki map software backslash slash backslash slash software email. Okay, so there's one map. And we put those thoughts on it. To chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 49 for wiki map software to backslash slash 35 backslash slash software email 1. Okay, but I get the feeling that this is sort of shallow, don't you? What else can we do with this? Well, the first was talking about structure, structuring people's communication. That's definitely something I want to think about. And the second, that's about recruiting people, and populating your collaboration space, right? We're going to want to keep our eyes on those. Now, let's look at the third we're talking about mapping software, but it also has to do with changes and it suggests versioning to my mind as well. These are concepts we're going to want to have structure for. S4 is similar. It's also about making changes, and hardening with time. I wouldn't be surprised if I had those ideas at a similar time, in fact. Another idea for changes, maybe versioning as well. Changes and versioning are pretty close to one another, no? We'll represent that graphically, in the map. S5 is smilar to S3, wherever S3 is, we'll have S5 as well. 
we talk a bit about voting, no, and it's connected to changes as well. So supposing that we wrote those keywords we realized on paper, we get the following structure recruiting populating changes versioning voting no on topical deliberation, TD notice that we've got some ideas that we're capturing as we go over these lists. I used to throw these away. But I think these deliberations actually have some value, after having done these for a while. I call it topical deliberation. My new experimental segment is topical deliberation, or TV, and I record it by straight chronology in its TOC, and on their pages. Note out. Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 50 Now, before we go on, I want to remind you of something, something I said earlier. I said that the maps we form here are more important than the actual content itself. Keep your eye on that, and reflect on that, as we remove on here. So, we need to be a map. After playing around with it, and remembering our connections, we draw the following structure recruiting populating for 235 wiki map soft backslash slash software changes voting slash email versioning one how's that? Isn't that neat? Yes, it'll get better. Let's note some things here like, some of the subleties expressed in the map. Note many are missing, because this is on a computer, and not on paper. I only have two levels here lower case and upper case, but I digress. Recruiting and populating are not directly linked, but we can see an implied connection between them, just by proximity. And look at how changes and versioning are closed together, and bound by a line. Voting and changes are connected by a line too, but we let voting go out the way isn't that interesting? In a TOC, you just smash everything together. And you can't express much more than above, below, indented in, and further out. You can simulate a forest of trees, but your trees can't intermingle into webs, and you only have so many levels, and you can only place your trees in a row. Most depressing. But maps are alive. They give you warm fuzzy thoughts and feelings. Yacht. Sometimes they even feel electric. Rock. PKQUU. Okay. Now let's populate the rest. Do we just want to automatically put our speeds on there? No, we want to consider them 1x1. Just because a speed helps suggest some structure, doesn't mean we necessarily want to place it in context with that structure. That's one that was the one about email, and wondering if people should structure their emails. Preferred to structure considered harmful. Let's look in the references. There in island structure considered harmful. It's rec number 8. Let's put it on our map. Note putting references on maps is difficult at times, because a book usually talks about a lot of stuff. If you want to, you can link in individual chapters of a book, but you'll need to know them chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 51 on the references section. Generally, references appear at the top of trees, or by key nodes in webs because they refer to so much amidst the children. Sad but true. In this case, we are lucky. The map is new, and so we mostly only have tops of trees, and there is perfect match between the reference and the top of this tree. I think that S1 is fair game for structure. Same with Ref8. One Ref8 structure recruiting populating for 235 wiki map soft backslash slash software changes voting slash email versioning one. Now we are running into the ugliness of computers. Sorry, I just can't easily make ref appear in a TDD capital letters, above and to the left of the number 8, superscript. Computers are so frustrating in these primitive days of ours. Now we'll go through S2 S5 a little quicker. S2 this says that you can't just make a wiki. You have to get people to populate it as well, or you have to populate it yourself. Okay, this is very relevant to populating, so we'll put it there. Yes, 3 This says you, you want mapping software where people can make changes. It also says that people should be able to make big changes. Now, I have some reservation here, because it also has a lot of stuff about the mapping software that doesn't have to do so much with changing in the abstract. To its grace. It does say that big changes should be possible, and that's an idea that abstracts. There is a general idea of big changes, and little detail work. What I'd probably do at this was on paper is take out my green pen, green equals icons, markup, meta, or maybe tolerate errors. My blue pen blue equals structure, and put a little letter by irrelevant stuff for this purpose, and a B by where it says big changes affect many should be possible. 
so the designation on the page would be 3B. Okay, pretend I make those edits, and we'll put 3B on. S for ways make changes, harden W flash time. Talking about with ease. If I were using my Psi icons, I would have put that this is a starting point for thought. Reflect on this icon there. But I don't want to go into that system, that's a mental techniques thing, not a notebook thing, for my writing purposes. Maybe some other day. So, we definitely want to put 4 onto the map, by changes. The idea of hardening with time is interesting. Chapter 3 Intersubject Architecture 50 to S5 Now, this is about voting, and what to do with bad votes, and what not, on the subject of electronic collaboration. Only a little is really about software maps. This could apply equally well to wikis, say, or any other type of collaborative system. Well, not email, right? Well, maybe so, I can't conceive of that. So this definitely attaches to voting. So this is what the map looks like when we are done. One ref eight structure recruiting to populating for two three five wiki map soft backslash slash three b four five software changes voting slash email versioning one doc. Now isn't that interesting? If it were just a toc, it would look something like this electronic collaboration one. Software the wiki b email c map software two. Changes three. Voting four. Versioning five. Recruiting six. Populating seven. Structure ref eight as traditionally done, would appear in the back of the book, not associated with structure. The connection between recruiting and populating is not apparent. I mean, sure, they are next to one another, but so is voting and versioning and recruiting. So you don't go looking for those patterns, with so much nonsense there. You could put in section delimiters here, but most people don't, and you still have to put those section delimiters in a row, the web isn't possible. Chapter 3 Intersubject architecture 53 isn't that interesting? But there's so much more. We just have only 6 items here. When it gets much larger, say, 100 items, or 200 items, the differences become much more dramatic and apparent. The superiority of the mock becomes far greater. Now we've trickled speeds onto the map. Sometimes, you will become aware that further work is needed, over time. Consider, that in my notebook's notebook, I used to have, attached to new section ideas, about nine speed thoughts. Whoa! Nine of them. Gets a bit unwieldy. So what you do, when one part starts to build up, is look up the items, and then further divide them. As it was, four of the ideas were related to chrono slash episodes. So I attended the line out from new section ideas, put subject chrono on the end of it, crossed out S121. S-112, S-114, S-120, and moved them to orbit subject chrono. Great. Whenever an area is getting congested, grow out. Going in the other direction don't build too much unnecessary structure. If you've got only two ideas in a location, don't put eight magnet words out there. Just park those two speed thoughts next to one magnet word, temporarily. As you build more speed thoughts there, then build structure as necessary. And a note about the structure this isn't supposed to be some absolute cosmic eternal perfect ontological structure. This is the associations you make in your head. It's a map of your mind. I don't even think a good basic pose can exist. Tolerate errors. If you are having a hard time tolerating errors, again, intentionally fuck things up. Anything else about trickling speeds over the map? Put them on the map. Park them somewhere. Push them out when they get too close. Some push down to. If a section of the map gets too dense, start another map page. Draw a big blue or red dashed line around the map section that was dense, and write M7 next to it, if the next map page is map page number 7. Oh, and don't try to fit too many maps to a page. You have to balance not wanting to flip to the next page and not wanting to have to replace the whole upage because of a big problem on just one map. You have plenty of paper, use it. But, information density, information density, it's a natural tension, until we get these maps computerized. See the killer easy notebook APP in the computer question chapter, the end of the book. Draw have a temporary space on your maps for speeds. You might want to draw a little parking lot U shape for the hard to place thoughts. And you might want to draw a little black hole too, 
that's for thoughts that should probably go to some other subject somewhere else. And you just aren't taking the time to transcribe them over yet. Yes you can have fun with this. Draw whatever you like. It's okay, it's your mind after all. Equals equals of course, if you are not like me, I guess you can do it Christadeline, or however you like. If you're a bohemian, you can't type it all up on a typewriter, if you like. Whatever floats your boat. Okay. I'm feeling done here. Anything else? No. Going, going, chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 54 liters et me say something for a moment. Remember there are two types of thought, intentional, and incidental. This writing process, this is mostly intentional. The framework I am writing to you is from my incidental analysis. I collected speeds incidental, a few poise intentional, mapped them out. And almost the entire structure of this book is based on the resulting structure. However, that structure isn't everything. You also have to reach out with your thought. As I write and expand this, I am also reaching out. Thus responsible for all of the um, anything else. Yes, yes. When I write a second draft, or whatever, I'll take all this stuff out. I'll leave this old one around, for those who prefer this, too. God bless your souls. Um, oh, write big thoughts big. For example, if you have a speed thought that is way more important than the others, make its dot bigger, and make its number bigger. How big? In proper proportion to the neighboring territories, and the same than reverse. If it's mind-bogglingly unimportant, write it so small that you need a magnifying glass to see it. Oh, oh, and another thing. This is what I was fishing my unconscious for. Your speeds, if you have speeds that are almost completely identical happens more than you'd think. Identify them with a slash between them. For example, if speeds 47 and 98 are almost identical, put it on the map like this 47 over 98 but if S84 and S33 are very similar, but warrant individual attention put the comma between them 8433 there you are. Done with talking about how speeds park on the MPA. Now I can't continue. Icons. Icons. Icons on the map? What the hell did I mean by icons on the map? Let me go back to my notebook's notebook, there it is. It says icons in green, next to P7, right there next to maps. I'm telling you my process, so that you can see that the notebook system works, and how it works. So I look up POI7. Ha ha. There it is. Subject mock icons, type recognition icons. Okay. So this is about how you pin stuff onto the map? Unfortunately, now I am really mad at our primitive computer technology, at this ASCII I am using to write this in. When I put this in docbook slash html, I'll be happy. Here, briefly, are my link designators. On the map number sign the speed thought is just a little dot. Top left corner chapter 3. Intersubject architecture 55 number sign a poise entry p number sign also a poise entry. The P is just a little P, top left corner this form is standard, and applies to everything below. Our number sign reference, special notes below CHD number sign cheat sheet ours number sign research PJ number sign project J sharp also a project references I use the kanji for book, in tiny form, top left of the rep number sign, to further denote that this is a book. The letters WS, for a little icon of a web, denotes a website. The kanji for person means a person, the kanji for people three persons make an organization that is a reference. Make up your own icons, if you don't know kanji. It's fun and easy. Equals just write them down and keep them somewhere in your notebooks system. I do believe ever know bookkeeper, but this system should keep a notebook subject. These are just my icons. Make up your own. But I strongly recommend just number sign for a speed thought since they are the most common, and the number sign shorthand for your poise, because they are second most common. Now the last part of talking about maps transitioning your maps. I've already talked about map transitioned a bit here, I'll try to repeat myself to a minimum. As I wrote before keep your scratch maps. Give them version numbers. If you are only changing a page of a map, that's a situation I've never run into, but it should be solvable. I'd version off that page number using letters. M35C would be version 3 of the whole map, 
Version C of page 5. Archive M35B back with where you are. Archive M35A. As you make a new map, you'll find that some old point and speed thoughts and other things are now obsolete. They are either notes on an old structure that no longer exists, or they are commentary on things that are no longer important to you. It's up to you what to do if you want. You can go to the old thought and place a note reading, idea obsolete, CXYZ, where XYZ is whatever is still present, but responsible for putting the old note to sleep. Or, you can just not write anything. It depends on how much time you have, how important that idea is to you, how frequently you linked to that idea or a predecessor pointing to it, the number of other factors. Personally, I think it's healthiest to look forward as you keep your notebook. Let the dead bury the dead. Chapter 3 Intrasubject Architecture 56 For stuff that is still on the new map just move it on over. If Magnet Word had number 124, 56, and 200 around them before, put them around it now too. If in doubt, put something on the new map. You can cross it off later, if you like. And that's it for the SMOC section. Let's recap page layout strategy trickling speeds over the map icons transitioning maps there's a simple page layout. You can use little stickies to keep your strategy in order. Speeds and other content build the structure of the map. More accurately, your attention builds the structure of the map. Remember this is a map of your mind. There are icons that you use such as 55, 12, and ref 5 that you place on the map. When you transition maps, keep your scratch work and you can point obsolete entrees to the new structure as you like. We've talked about P&P, we've talked about speeds, we've talked about the SMOC. Next up are the POI. Point of interest POI A POI is like a journal entry, but specific to a particular point of interest. The title specifies the point of interest. I have three things to say about POI 1. Content under the POI 2. Transgressing the POI boundary 3. Interlinking POI the first has to do with content within a POI. What you write in the POI must be consistent with the title of the POI. The title usually outlines the problems that you are trying to solve. These components are interfering with one another. Or a goal that you are trying to reach the theory of XYZ, or something that you want to articulate in greater detail. Perhaps you have collected a bunch of speed thoughts that are related, and you want to describe their interrelationship. The question you want to answer, the subject you want to reflect on whatever. Then you write. You try to solve what you want to solve, or reflect, or analyze, or whatever. Anything that doesn't have to do with the title is effectively lost. When you look on the mock, and are looking for a piece of information, if it's buried chapter 3, intersubject architecture 57 away in some point with a title that doesn't describe it, then you can't find that piece of information. Thus the great importance of keeping the point on topic which takes us to, to transgressing the POI boundary. When you get off topic, you are transgressing the boundary. If you catch yourself early enough, just get a new page and make it the beginning of a new POI. Sometimes you catch yourself late, though. In that case, circle in red what has transgressed. Start a new POI page. Put a link from the red circled part in the old POI to the new POI page, and vice versa. Then continue in the new POI as if everything was fine. If, at a later point, you decide that this particular POI is important enough, and the link annoying enough, you can always make a new version of the POI page, which brings us to the next subject. Three interlinking POI POI can be linked topically, or by version. Topical links are easy, you just say, see also XYZ, where XYZ is the idea of the other resource. For example, if you are referring to POI number 25, you just write C also P25, and maybe a little note on what P25 is about. If you are linking beyond the subject, include the subject as well C also GKI P25, or GKI your target subject. I personally use an icon in place of C also, I recommend doing the same. Just make one up. Mine looks like OO with a circle around it. How do you version POI? Not the same way as maps are versioned. To make a new version of a POI, just start a new POI entry. Then link the new version back to the old, and vice versa. If you ever follow a link to the old version, update the link to point to the new version, wherever the link's source is. If you get a long chain of versions, 
You can put additional navigation information by the links. You can write first version, P4, last version, P14, latest version, P46. However you like. And that's it for Poise. They are very simple, really. Cars, research research pages are like Poise, but they are particularly about researching some problem using other people's comments. Poise are always original to you. Cars is always based on outside research. There is a bit of a blur between them. You will have to exercise your own judgment. There are better guidelines I could write, but I'm in a hurry, damn it. I should distinguish cars from ref reference. Ref is your own notes, attached to one, and one only, reference. Furthermore, ref comes out of attempts to understand a given reference. Chapter 3 Intersubject Architecture 58 Abstract Model that form in your mind because of the ref should be in a poise as an articulation of your thoughts. But the attempt to decide for the reference itself goes into ref. But ours is for when you are bouncing back and forth between multiple references, and you have a train of thought going. The title of the ours reflects the train of thought going on. Inside of an ours, you refer to several refs. It can be as formal or informal as your needs meet. If you are writing an arse, but don't want to take the time to cite your references, that's okay. You realize that you can only look up later what you write. But sometimes, that's not your purpose. You're just trying to establish a line of thought. Citations, be damned. You still want to keep that paper. It is a valid arse, though rough. If you later care about it more, and want to add the full citations, you can just write them on the paper, or make a new version of the arse. Whatever you like. Ref, references reference pagination is something I've already talked about. Remember that it works basically like this subject ref reference number sign, reference page scheme, page number so for example, if you wrote three pages of notes while reading a book on the new sphere, your three page numbers might look like GP ref 13 ii dot for dot a1 GP ref 13 ii dot for dot a2 gp ref 13 ii dot for dot a3 that is gki for global knowledge infrastructure ref 13 being the 13th reference in use references list ii dot for dot a meaning part 2 chapter 4 section 8 and 1 or 2 or 3 being your personal page number i want to say something important here if at all possible just keep your notes in your books if your book belongs to you and it has a granger then by all means grangerize it it's your book. It'll be worth more to you if you put your thoughts in it. That's what a Granger is there for so that you can write in it. So do so. Write in your books, whenever you can get away with it. No need to keep paper in your binders when you've already got it between your book covers. And you don't have to do any expensive linking operation. So there you go. Those are my thoughts on the matter. I've said it. Some people are religious about their books. Hot well keep your notes on whatever isn't original to you in here. Books, interviews, notes on people, the backs of bubblegum wrappers, letters, whatever. Okay, ref is done. The hardest part about ref is the page numbering. After that, it's obvious what to do. PJ, Project Chapter 3 Intersubject Architecture 59 The PJ segment is where you keep notes that have to do with your projects, if they aren't complete subjects in themselves. If you are going to be working on a project for some time, make it its own subject. It'll probably be predominantly poise, with a chrono segment, and many strategy notes, as well. But if you have a small project that, won't take more than 3 to 5 sequences, just keep the notes for it within your subject, and label them with a PJ segment identifier. I, index sometimes, you'll be looking for all of your thoughts on a particular subject. If you do that, you may repeat the search again in the future. Why go to all that work, again? So what you do is you cache the results of your lookup. The index is the place to do it. I recommend making the printer template for index pages. Keep the template printouts in an informal blank papers or templates section in your common store binder. That way, you don't have to keep making these things over and over. Note this is something that I have not done myself, but believe would be a good idea. Perhaps when I put this online, along with accompanying format pages, I'll make an index as well, in both one page and three page format. To start an index for a small subject, just do this get a blank piece of ruled paper. Write index at the top. 
put the letters AZ on the left. Now, whenever you start a search for a subject, pull out the index sheet. Write, in blue because your search word is a key, the search word, next to the letter that the word starts with. So for example, if I'm looking in my social ideology subject for everything having to do with anarcho-socialism, I'm going to put that worm next to the letter A. Then start your search, beginning over at a mock. If you don't find what you are looking for mock miss, then you may have to start going page by page generally happens when your mock isn't up to date. Write the results the hits as you find them. Then put the index page back. Sometimes the page you were looking for wasn't even in the subject. That's okay. When you find the page, link to it from the same index you started the search from. Your brain is messy. The notebook system is messy. It's good, it's useful, it works, but part of the reason it works so well is because it tolerates errors. If you don't tolerate errors, you are going nowhere with this all. By the way, in case I forget to mention it later it's good to have an index like this for your entire notebook system, as well. Keep the index at Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 60 The front of your common store binder. Link words to subjects that they are featured in. You can start with one page, but as you search, and as your subject grows, you may need to expand to a three-page index. Just give each letter three lines. Symbols and numbers I put numbers after Z. I also put all symbols after the numbers. Depending on your symbol system, you may be able to find a way to form a hash key perhaps a circle. If half your symbols involve a circle, you may not. Just part of the trick of dealing with symbols. That's it for indexes. CHT. Cheat sheets. Cheat sheets are great. I do this a lot in my computer notebooks. You take your most commonly used pieces of information, and fit them all onto a single cheat sheet. You use it to work with. It will probably be highly abbreviated. Good organization is important. Information density to the max. The cheat sheet goes near the very end of the subject, so you can find it quickly. If you have several cheat sheets, you may need a TOC for them. You can put the TOC in front of the cheat sheets that is, near the back of the subject or with the rest of the TOCs near the front of the subject, it's up to you, really. The cheat sheets are followed by A slash S, abbreviations, shorthand. The A slash S is placed at the far end of the subject, because you will want quick and ready access to it. You will probably want to even take it out of the binder, if you will be writing a lot. As you invoke abbreviations, or create symbols or shorthand, record them on the A slash S. That way, in a year, you can figure out what in the world you were talking about. Date your A slash S sheets. It's important, so that if you stumble across an old point, and you find a symbol that's not on the present version of the A slash S, you can go back into the archives and find which A slash S was relevant at the time. If you can't remember to freeze your A slash S sheets as well right to the date that you stop using the particular A slash S sheet. A slash S sheets frequently look like index pages, you have the letters on the left, and you write keys in blue and values in black. You will probably want the global A slash S sheet, that you keep in your Catriabot binder, and that applies over all notebooks. Mine personally is four pages long, with different sections. It has entries like T2 and F of and W with, woe without, as well as a person table NH Napoleon Hill and Simone Chomsky M B Michael and. By the way, I should probably put this somewhere else. But when you are dealing with English names, you get good packing with the following division AB Chapter 3. Intersubject Architecture 61 C Def G H I J K L M N O P Q R Street U C S Don't believe me? Try it. You'll be amazed how evenly names fill into it. Now, I've described the major segments that I use P and P, Purpose and Principle Speeds, Speed Thoughts SMOC, Subject Map of Contents Poi, Point of Interest Studies HARS, Research Ref, Reference PJ, Project I, Index CHD, Cheat Sheets A slash S, Abbreviations, Shorthand I. Now want to describe segments that I am experimenting with. That is, what might work. Remember there's no binder police. And there's no enormous institution telling you what is cutting edge and what is not, what you can research and what you can't, and who will ignore you without proper credentials. Nothing of the sort. 
and if there were, you may have good reason to ignore is or no. So make shit up, and post to the web the results of your experiments. At the very least, email me. I'm interested. The first experimental segment is X. That enables you to experiment within a segment, without worrying that the rest of your notebook system will fail. The special thing about X pages is that they are temporary, and it signals to you do not link to this page. Because it might be gone later. It's extra volatile. Boom. Your notebook just went up in flames. They use GH. If you find that you are relying on your experimental pages later on, then that's pretty good. That means it isn't really experimental anymore. Just Chapter 3 Intrasubject Architecture 62 White out your X's, or cover them up with a big blob of ink, or turn the X into a start, or something like that. Now, there are for particular experimental segments I am working out, lately such, chronological episode TV, topical deliberation TV, data dictionary definitions L flash T, lists and tables high info density we'll go over each in turn set chronological episodes I've always had subjects that were nothing but your traditional diary slash journal. One most notably, I do that in the strategy subject, which is intrinsically temporal, but we can standardize the concept for other subjects that need it, and we can make it stronger as well. For example, the events in our lives aren't just individual frames, they frequently belong to threads, or episodes. So I have been experimenting with creating GAN style charts that map out episodes. You write the TOC no, not a mock, because time is intrinsically linear sideways, and up down identify threads, across identify time. Your first thread should be unthreaded or non-episodic. Anything that is not episodic, or theme bound how I feel today goes in that top band. For your themed entrees, or progression in episodes, you use the lower bands. So that's something I think is worth looking at more. Presently, I am in the mobilization phase, not a vision phase, and am thus not working my binder system, so I don't have a chance to try it out right now. Let me know how it works and how it doesn't work. Next TV, topical deliberation remember how, when we're constructing the new version of a map, or we are focusing on where to place something we're making a bunch of judgments. Sometimes we even use paper to help us form those judgments. I would call those things topical deliberation. I'd store four to six topical deliberations to a page. This is sort of like speeds, we can keep 45 speeds on a single page and ID them individually. Similarly, I'd put TV1, TV2, TV3, TV4, and TV5 on a single page. They are usually brief. These are our hard-earned judgments, so we can refer back to them in the future. Then mark them on your mock. They don't need a single spot. Thou's key topical deliberation usually applies to a region or an area. So I think it'd be best to put a dashed line around the region of controversy that the TV1 what? Nonsense you say. That's not according to the system. Hey. Fuck you. There's no binder police. Tolerate errors. Chapter 3. Intrasubject architecture 63 clears up, and then label is with the TV. I'd put it in blue or green since the magnet words and structure lines are already blue. Not red, it attracts too much attention. And it's not normal content, definitely not black. Green is nice and easily ignored. You can consider it green as in markup for the map, which in Island TV, Data Dictionary if you do this long enough, you'll find yourself making up words. And the meaning of those words may change size, or spawn off new words better. Confucius thought our problems came from shifting language, words meaning something other than they meant. Ted Nelson experimented with interpreting this literally, but ran into some problems with it. Too many new words constantly springing into existence, I believe it was. I'd keep track of this in a data dictionary. It would probably not be a Z, since definitions are big, and we don't want to partition one page per letter tax 26 pages, of which you may only use a few. Probably best would be two just as entries as you think them up. Then, periodically, type it all into a computer, alphabetize it, print it out, and then stick it back in your notebooks. Keep additions on new pages, and modifications in red. Then go back to the computer when the time comes, and later, rinse, repeat. 2. You can also link to the DVs from the SMOC wherever it would be helpful to be reminded of particular terminology. Yacht. 
This is the way. Yes, it's FF tactics. L flash T. Lists and tables I frequently find myself maintaining lists and tables within Poi Entrees. These are things I access frequently, and would probably best go near the end of the subjects, to share space with cheat sheets. At the very least, they just don't feel like Poi. So I want another section for them. L flash T is my answer to this tugging feeling. I have not tried it yet. So, there you go. Those are the segments of the intrasubject architecture. We've talked about physical pages layout may want to reread, now that you've seen the segments logically described, and we've talked about the segments themselves. We're halfway through the book. Woohoo! Coming up next, is the extra subject architecture. Too much better way. Partition your dictionary pages into four squares. A single data dictionary page has 4 dB or maybe use def. Entries. X first pages has dB1 dB4. Next has dB5 dB8. Then dB9 dB12. Yada yada yada. Now what you do is have a hash TOC for the dBs. You just put the alphabet on the left side of the page. Your keys, over 1 to 3 pages. Start at 1, then later expand to 2, then later to 3, and then set your keys up as the words that are defined and the values to the dd number sign of the word defined. There you go. Chapter 3. Intrasubject Architecture 64 After you understand that, you have everything you need to start working this system, then if you want to keep reading, you can read the theory of notebooks, and the question of computers. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture Topics The physical representation of the complete system to the mock, the grand subject map of contents subject registry hash of all subjects subject sectioning, how subjects are made, just a interconnect process of constructing handling king the new subject special subjects, chrono, strategy, site guys, tracking, and others these things bind everything together in the system. The physical representation of the complete system you have three major categories of binders your carry about binder medium your common store binder enormous your archival binders size irrelevant but enormous is good your carry about binder will contain the following blank paper blank speed pages blank pan subject speed pages just mock subjects registry 65 chapter 4 extra subject architecture 66 subject speeds and reps toc global a slash s optionally one or two subjects locally cached subjects other stuff your common store binder will contain the following blank paper blank template pages such as indexes maps tocs etc. Subject P and P's chaos unplaced pages as many subjects as you can stuff in there your archive store binders will contain the following the rest of the subjects. Archive store binders are kept by alphabet ranges. For example, if you had two binders, they might be AM and NZ, depending on how you decided to balance them. Chaos is stored in the archive store binders under C. It might be big. Every now and then, you might just want to bump out whole sections of chaos. What is chaos? Chaos is just papers that have hordes of thoughts on them with no obvious subject placement, or that are so hopelessly beyond recovery or take so long to recover that you might likely just throw it out, but that you'd like to give it one last chance. After staring at it for a while, though, you decide, nah, toss it. And you do. Or you don't. I've occasionally found a jewel in there, Whatever you like. The archives are pretty straightforward. You just store stuff in them. Now let's consider the common store binder. I frequently call it the subject cache. It's where the subjects that you have been using for the last two to six weeks go, ones that you are accessing frequently. Whenever you need some space in the common store, you can do two things put archival pages in your subject on interest into a corresponding subject in the archive. You have fewer pages now, and a more nimble subject. But you can only do this if you have archival pages in your present subject. Put the whole subject, ideally one you haven't touched in a few weeks, into the archive. Done. This is the most common way of clearing up some space. This includes chaos. Just take all the chaos pages out and put them into the archival's chaos section. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 67 You may need to buy or scrounge around for another archival binder, but there you go. Now in your common store, what are we keeping again? Blank paper blank template pages such as indexes, maps, TOCs, etc. 
subject PNPs chaos unplaced pages as many subjects as you can stuff in there put those sections in the following order 1. P and page 2. Paper blank first, then templates last. 3. Unplaced 4. Chaos 5. Sections most of these you are already pretty familiar with. I'll talk a little bit more about P and P and unplaced here P and P you want every subject's P and P here, arranged alphabetically. Almost all are one page only, I've never seen the two pager. If you have older version, the older version should not appear here, only the most recent. The older version gets an archive bit set, and you throw it in either the subject's archive back pages, or into the archival binders. That's pretty simple. Unplaced these are for proto subjects you have a few pages on the subject, but you don't have quite enough pages to warrant actually putting a tab delimiter in place, using some of your template pages, and whatnot. You just want to give the pages a temporary rest stop, and see what happens. Maybe one day you'll have some more thoughts on the subject, maybe you won't. Important considerations do not number the pages. There is no subject yet, and thus no pagination. However. You do want to clearly identify the subject that they would go in, both at the bottom of the page as if it were a full page ID, just without anything more specific than the subject name itself, and at the top left of the page. I don't know why. It just seems to work for me. You don't really have to. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 68 When an unplaced subject reaches a sufficient size, say 7 to 10 pages roughly. Then take your pages out and promote the pages to a full subject. Toddy Start a mock, maybe a relevant TOC, fill out the tab, update the JSMOC, registry, and you're done. There, we're done with the common store notebook, also a relatively simple subject. And now for the carry about notebook. This is a mid-sized binder. It's not one of those really ultra-thin binder, but it's not a gigantic daddy long legs binder either. mid size. It needs to be comfortable to carry. It must be durable. More so than the others must be. This thing is going to get pretty messed up. You're going to be constantly fiddling with it. It is going to get dropped. Lost. Drool on. Keep it safe. Protect it with your life. You're going to hold an incredibly vast amount of information in there. Your latest speed thoughts on every single subject. That's information density. And you're going to be carrying it into a hostile environment the world. The rest of your binders the common store, the archive, they are not going to be in the world. They are going to be in a pocket universe called your bookshelves. But your local cache, your carry about notebook, that's going to be with you in everywhere, except where there's water. It contains blank paper blank speed pages blank can subject speed pages mock subjects registry subject speed pages and reps toc global a slash s optionally one or two subjects locally cached subjects other stuff here's their order in your binder one other stuff two blank paper blank speeds blank pan subject speeds in that order three just mock for subjects registry chapter four Extra subject architecture 69.5 Subject speeds and reps TOC 6 Global A slash S7 More other stuff 8 Optionally included subjects Question marks mean optionally present Let me start with the easy ones first Then tackle the complex things last Other stuff I have a hybrid between this notebook system This thought system And the GTD system getting things done David Talent I call the combination X, the act communication thought system. It requires pages in my carry about binder. They go either at the beginning or the end. Frequently, people will hand you stuff, like flyers, or whatever. Just keep it at the back or front of your binder. Blank papers, nothing needs to be said. Keep it well stocked. Global A slash S, we've already talked about this, in the intrasubject architecture. This is the same thing. Just four things that apply to your entire notebook system, or for roughly more than two to three subjects. Optional subjects Sometimes you are busy performing some maintenance operation mapping speed thoughts, or are working on a point or something, and you just can't leave the subject. So you're going to have to carry it with you. Easily done. Just open your common store subjects, pop out the subject you want, and place it into your carry about notebook, at the very end.
work on it while you are away, over the objections of your girlfriend, and then when you get back, you can pop it right back into the common store. Now we're just left with hard stuff just mocked. Subject registry subject speed pages and reps TOC wheel tackle subject speed pages flash reps TOCs first. Things to keep in mind subject speeds and references are together. Organized alphabetically. Only latest speeds, but all references. That is you take all of the latest speeds and all of the reference TOCs for all of your subjects. Then you arrange them alphabetically fully. Expand out your acronyms by subject. In pairs speed references pairs. The latest speed page comes first, followed by all of the references. Chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 70 or not. You could just keep the references in their respective subjects, most likely in the common store or the archives. But I prefer to keep the references with me in my carryabout, so that I can add to them when I talk with people, and so that I can't share them with interested people. Or you could keep the references separate from all of the speeds. However you like. This is just the way I've done it. It's important to remember that only the latest speed needs to be in the carryabout notebook. Since there is a higher risk to data that's in the carryabout, I try to keep as much as possible in common store or archives. Speeds are very dense, so all the more reason to be careful about them. Now, that wasn't so hard. Finally, the JSMOC and subjects registry. Then we get on talking about subject sectioning, how subjects are made, just a interconnect process of constructing and linking the new subject special subjects, chrono, strategy, site guys tracking, and others so. The JSMOC and subjects registry. What they are like, what they look like. Placing subjects on the JSMOC. Proximity tight versus loose connections mental association, not logical connection one half subjects, subjects without contents. What to do with the subjects registry? The grand subject map of contents is mocked is a map of all of your subjects. It will probably start out being just a single page, and will likely balloon out to be several pages large. You'll use it for a number of purposes, not limited to finding subjects for your thoughts. Discriminating the subject to place a thought into. Organizing the subjects of your thought. Reorganizing the subjects. Locating thoughts that you've thought before. Keeping track of subjects. Chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 71 being amazed at. Reflecting on who you are and what you are doing. Or not doing, as the case will likely be, at that particular moment. The JSMOC isn't alone, it has the subject registry right behind it. That is, two pages at least, with a hash of your subjects over their first letter. That is, you have ABCDFG, written down the left side. One letter to two lines. As you create subjects, you'll list them in the hash. You want a list of all of your subjects, in addition to your map. Why? Because you're going to have some sorts of tags that you are going to attach to subjects, that should be accessible in the context of the map. The map is awesome at helping you find stuff by area, by field, but if you already know the name of your subject, and are holding that name in mind, rather than a vague intention, the list is going to help you a lot more. Sort of like the difference between the general Google index lookup you know, the one that everyone uses and that hangs out on their front page, and the Google directories which are actually DM hosy. You may well have some subjects that are not mapped. I listed those in green on the directories. In particular, I have a holdover from previous days pre-system called lists. It shows up in green on the directories, but nowhere on the maps. You don't have to do it that way. Nowadays, with what I know now, I would just make a place on the maps for unplaced or unplatable, and parked the subject name in there. The unplaced section itself. Four pages that are unplaced, also appears in the grand subject registry GSR. Again, it could go on the map to in the unplatable location. I might even draw a little warehouse picture next to it, or draw a little empty car parking spot you around it, or something like that but I happen to have put it in the GSR. I also keep track of my archived subjects in there, as well. For example, I used to have Action and Rebound, before I started the present notebook system, which has assimilated and cannibalized them somewhat. They appear on my GSR, with a little red bold character the Chinese character I showed before next to them, indicating you don't put stuff in here, it's old. Incidentally, 
They also appear on the Jizmok. They are drawn faintly, and also have the old character next to them. But it is not my promise with myself that it will be the case. My promise is that every subject has an appearance on the GSR. But they don't need an appearance on the Jizmok. It's just a good idea. As you work with the system, you will feel the desire to have a GSR, a place where you can flag subjects conveniently, all in one place, but without using the Jizmok. You'll love your Jizmok, but you'll want the GSR as well. So, I am done talking about the GSR. Now, what does the Jizmok look like? Well, it depends on if it is small or big. Jizmok V1 will be so puny, in fact, that it should include the GSR on the same page. That's what I did. The top two-thirds of the page represent your map. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 70 to Chizmoks always get convoluted with time. In fact, this applies to any map. Then there's a revolution. You toss the old map well. Archive it. Make an interim map remember. Give it a full version number. And then perhaps rewrite the interim into a nice new clean well-organized map. This happens with programming, too. Lots of systems. So there it is. Then the bottom third is just your GSR. It doesn't even have to be alphabetical, because it's so small. Just hunt and peck at what's there. When one page is no longer enough, you'll do what I said above. And remember the first page of your new, multi-page map, is just a map of your maps. I drew the small maps in miniature on the front page. Sort of light maps of the USA The first page is the whole USA and it shows you the subdivisions over the maps to the rest of the USA. And they usually have this special cutout for Hawaii and Alaska. And that's what your first page of your Chizmok looks like. Include little page numbers, in blue, to the actual pages themselves. The page numbers have got to stick out. You could even put it in red, though blue is more consistent with the color scheme I've described. Blue structure, page numbers, etc. Now remember your Jizmok is also a major strategy point. You're going to be putting those little tabs on the page. So size your subjects accordingly. We want density, but we also want to be able to see the strategy tabs. You'll know how big your strategy tabs are, once you've bought them. Ah, I knew I was fishing around in my mind for something. Okay we're moving along to placing subjects on the Jizmok. Proximity tight versus loose connections mental association not logical connection then we'll talk about half subjects. I sense that I am missing some things. Unfortunately, I cannot articulate what they are. My notebook system has done what it can for me here. The notebook system works, it works great, but it doesn't always give you everything, and sometimes you'll feel that there is something missing. Sometimes the feeling is wrong, but often it is right. Even the notebook system, an amazing and wonderful catch, even if is bounded by the laws of time and priority. It works far better than not having one at all, but it is not immortal or omnipotent. If I was carrying out my notebook today, there would be two results one. This section would be complete, in the notebook. Two. You would not be reading this, because I would be immobilized. Because of the way the notebook system works. Remember the dialectic between intentional thought versus caught thought. The intentional thought is you actively going out into the mind. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 73 and get yourself some thoughts. That's what I'm doing now, as I'm writing. I'm using the notebook to guide me, based on the content and structure accumulated before. I assure you if I had not been keeping my notebooks, this document, that you see in front of you now, would not have been possible to write. I might be able to write something here and a little something there, but it would be nowhere near as structured yes, I know the structure is not visible yet, but it's there, nor nowhere near as complete even with the tiny things that I miss, as it is now. You'll experience the sense of completeness, as well as the heightened sense of incompleteness, as you practice the notebooks, and envision Zanadu 1 in your mind. Diversion Alert Diversion Alert Thinking about information and architecture will be extremely important to society in the future. All these programmers wondering, why aren't we reusing each other's components? Yes, very significantly, our languages and practices are limiting us. Quite severely. But even if we had the best reuse languages mechanisms and whatnot, 
we still need it to be easier to figure out what other people have written. The retrieval problem is massive. Even with wikis and automatic lists and Oriole books and stuff like that, it's still enormously difficult. Just reading the left slash book is extraordinarily intimidating. If you're just trying to make a simple command language for your app, yes, we know that simple languages turn complex quickly. But don't beat people up about it. Write a better explanation of how to use Lex Flash Eek. Or better yet, realize that it's complex, and write a simplified version, and then take the time to hook it into our programmer's social system. And suppose you do intend to write a better one. What are you going to do spend two years reading every guy's paper in the world on the subject? Or are you going to maybe spend a few days looking, and then start? You aren't going to spend two years looking for and reading all the papers. You're just going to sit down and do it. And some guy somewhere is going to say, outrageous. He didn't read my paper. So, there are several things here. We need collaboratively constructed and canonical maps. This is hard to do but worth doing. Probably not strategic at the moment, there are better PFTs to work on. For example, figuring out how to just collaboratively build a map with friends over a blank piece of paper, and then writing about it, would be a good first step. We need a few canonical perhaps competing, if they fork bases for work. We need the public to be involved, indeed, primary, for all this stuff. People need to teach shit visually, so people can get up to speed and contributing as quick as possible. Thus, we need visual tools and explaining one Ted Nelson's name for the Infinite Mental Nosphere database, I think. I may have misunderstood what he meant. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 74 Tools Light Years Beyond Anything We Have Now Yes, I realize this book is all text. Sorry. A good diagram could lop off a ton of paragraphs here. But with today's tools and my skill using them, it's much quicker for me to make a ton of paragraphs. You end up losing here, because you have to read my tonnage. I have a general picture of how all these things fit together public field technologies. I want to write about it in the future. It's not on the immediate roster, though. Okay, back to wherever we were. Let me figure this out. Replay proximity tight versus loose connections mental association, not logical connection. Then we'll talk about half subjects. You put your subjects on the map, like we described before about maps. You put things that are sort of connected close to one another, and those that are distantly connected far from one another. This is based on your mental associations, not on any sort of a suppose absolute cosmic eternal perfect ontological structure. Examples Examples are good. Personal subjects map spirit mind first ethics imp. Admonishment flash backslash values I am PPL backslash slash the ident p psi kc ts and the k slash slash backslash slash chrono edu backslash notebooks slash backslash p hist p r s n l records systems mock v22 chapter 4 extra subject architecture 75 i've removed some things which are difficult to draw in ascii such as the fate action and rebound and accompanying old marker also this just doesn't do justice to the real deal at all Another strike against computers with today's technology. But anyways, I'll try to make it clear. The page marker is on the bottom right. It says Jizmok V22 meaning that this is version 2 of the Jizmok, and that it's page 2 in particular. I've titled this particular Jizmok page, though I didn't have to. The title is Personal Subject Map. There are others Communication Subject Map which is the page left of this one. Society Subject Map to the left of Communication an untitled map beneath these three, and beneath that is computer land, where I've got all sorts of computer subjects. The title is written in blue. On the left, are two subject names with dashed lines instead of full circles, indicating that the subjects aren't actually on this page. Those are PVL people and EU education, both of which exist on the communications page, again, to the left of the present page. I put left in quotes because the page is actually Jizmok V24. That is, page 4. Two pages after the present one. But it is arranged on the front page of the Jizmok as if it were to the left. Think back to the analogy of the USA map California may well be west of Alabama, but Alabama's map may show up first, if the map is presented in alphabetical order. This is not a difficult concept. 
I include the link to make the connection clear. You don't have to, but I think it's a good idea. Systems is similar, but it's below rather than on the left. Now, there are two special items on the map, Mind First and the Ident. Those are what I call half subjects. I'll write more about those in a moment, but basically, they are subjects that are only speed lists at this point in time, or perhaps they are accumulating mass in unplaced, but not yet a full, formally recognized subject. The two half subjects are not actually written on the page, they are written on the little strategy stickies. They have a fat red dot drawn on them, to differentiate them from strategy stickies. Half subjects, after all, may be retracted. They don't appear on the GSR. They may be merged with something else whatever. They are in flux. So they don't get inked onto the paper. Actually, you know what, I don't have much more to say about half subjects, so let's just consider that I talked about them. Not much more to them. The half subjects here are demonstrating what I was saying about proximity and distance reflecting subject matter. Mind first is a speed list of thoughts pertaining to the notion that we are primarily, in mind, mental beings. It has to do with recognizing our identity as minds, that everything we experience, even the world, is a bunch of symbols and mind images and whatnot that are thrown at us. I don't believe that minds are our core identity awareness, but that we happen to be inhabiting Chapter 4. Extra Subject Architecture 76 them, and that our particular configuration is unique to ourselves by various accumulations and circumstances. We seem to be reshaping the world based on our mental constructs. If we were omnipotent, or telekinetic or whatnot, it would become very apparent to us that the world was based on our minds, not on the environment that gave birth to us. So, all those kinds of thoughts appear in mind first. My true calling, however, could be titled spirit first, or awareness first, and is encapsulated in the spirit subject position. Mind first is clearly in the metaphysical domain. But I don't see it quite as good as the eternal spirit. There's a sort of semiotic rule that above is considered higher, and so I am positioning mind first above and to the right of MP metaphysics, but beneath spirit. It's closest to metaphysics. Now, we're talking about spirit and ethics and metaphysics and values and imagination and whatnot. Don't be frightened. Remember I'm not saying that these connections are real or anything, or even necessarily the logical best connections. I'm saying that these are my mental associations. But this is by no means an A-suppose, or even an attempt at an A-suppose. This is just the way I hook things up in my mind. There are times where I perform radical reconfigurations, and everything changes. Not only in my notebooks, but sometimes in my life as well, the notebook is a mirror of what's going on in your mind. Manipulations in the notebook are manipulations in your mind, and vice versa. When you are manipulating yourself, it can be a good idea to do so before a mirror. There is no brain mirror well, okay, surgeons differ, but, but there is this notebook, which is a mind mirror. So there you go. Think about that. I mean, I do. I contemplate that a lot. I think it's profoundly interesting. If it means nothing to you, well, okay. But I think that's fascinating. Amazing. But no. I'm not making the Kabbalah here. This is not Einsoft and K3 and Chakma and Dina and the Void or whatever. If you want to study that kind of stuff, great. The notebook system can help. Make a section called Kabbalah, study in there, and link it into your system on the Jizmok however you like. But the system above is not Kabbalah. It's a mind map. If you feel there are cosmic connections, fine. Maybe personal identity, chronology, personal history and personal records can be modeled by some abstract timeless pattern. Wait the SEC, what am I doing? I'm POOPOing the idea of using other people's established structures. I shouldn't be doing that. It's true, I don't want to alienate people who are very anti-spiritualist and anti-religious, and things like that. At the same time, I don't think it's right to say no to people who are spiritualists. And there are fundamental patterns. We know this in programming for a fact, we call them design patterns. Similarly, in life, there are patterns as well, and people have codified them into legends, and they have moved people in powerful and useful ways, and have helped people organize and understand their lives. Chapter 4
extra subject architecture 77 so i take that back if you are a cabalist and you naturally associate things through the mental framework you've inherited from the cabalist's tradition do so that comes naturally to you we are mirroring your mind after all so you should do it that way i would just suggest that you not feel confined to that structure at any rate i want to make clear to everybody that this structure above is just a map of things i think about I think there's a metaphysical quality to my thoughts about values, and certainly my thoughts about imagination. Similarly, ethics is related to values, but it is kind of separate, and the same between ethics and metaphysics, but more distant. This conversation isn't nonsense I'm demonstrating the working of the mapping process. I could say it more literally, but as I said I'm just spitting this out. So, my apologies if I have offended anyone's sensibilities. Major apologies to everyone for writing so poorly. So, that was a lengthy demonstration of how subjects are placed and configured. It's a combination of semiotics and proximity slash distance and other stuff. And the maps you make will make the most sense to you. As it should be. No way suppose here. Now I think I have one thing to add. Sometimes, a subject comes directly out of another subject. PTUI. One subject like metaphysics got so many thoughts that were easy to isolate like values, that it spat it out. So you have two subjects. Sometimes, until the two subjects get some more distance from one another, I will notate the link between the two with something other than a line. It denotes tight coupling. Loose coupling, subject A, subject B, tight coupling, subject A, subject B, it doesn't have to be horizontal, that's just an artifact of writing with ASCII. However, do notice that I placed them closer, and that I use a bunch of perpendicular lines perpendicular to the direction of connection to denote the link. Sometimes, over time, the coupling loosens. On the next version of the map, I turn to note the loose connection on the map. And remember very loose connections don't even get a line at all. You just rely on proximity alone. Now I've described that links appear because there are associations between subjects but it gets better than that. Did you know that there's a very good chapter for extra subject architecture 78 way to determine the proximity slash connection type in a very objective way? As in the computer could figure it out. It's true. Think about it what tells us about the connection between subjects. The P and P. The purpose and principles page. The more complex the protocol is between two subjects, the greater their coupling. Or at least, it tends that way. So if you have a bunch of rules in the P and P over how thoughts divide between two subjects, that's a good indicator that those subjects tightly coupled. If there's just a single P and P reference, then it probably means a normal or distant link, but still unworthy of an explicit line. So, there you go. You can see P and P at work while you determine your Jizimok tensions. So I want to make sure something is very clear vary the length of your links. You want to vary them. There's this sort of pristine computer ethic going around, that we want precision and equal lengths and stuff. I agree we want precision. But we don't find it in uniformity. A manifestation of the design versus iteration tension in computer programming, we find it in the variable. We want to be able to vary the length of the connection. Things that are more closely related, pull them in things that are further afield, but still connected, let them go out a bit. Okay. Oh. It just occurred to me. I recently observed something on my Jizimok. There's a pattern that I now call a subject feeder. That is, I was working on a bunch of individual subjects GKI, anarcho science, communes, meetings, electronic collaboration, and was getting some names confused. I was rooting speeds between subjects a lot. Does it go there? No, it goes over there. Much later, what was I thinking? This doesn't go here, it goes there much later what where the hell does this thought go it was confusing and that meant that i had a framework flaw so i reorganized my maps standardized my names for things until everything was clear and found i had a new subject pfd for public field technologies it was different than my conception of anarcho science and it was different than my thoughts about the global knowledge infrastructure and it was different than all these other things and it turned out to be what I am calling a subject feeder. That is it did a really good job of showing where to put other thoughts. 
Sometimes I even threw the speed into the subject feeder speed list, because I hadn't quite internalized the new organization, to be able to quickly place the speed, and maybe I had important things to do at the time. So I just threw it into the subject feeder bin, or in this case, TFD. Then as I processed my speeds, with map in hand, I would forward the speed to where it needed to go. Computers come in really handy around now. Anytime you are transcribing shit, you're always kicking yourself wishing for computers. I have things to say about this in a computer chapter, chapter VR. So you may witness the same thing subject feeders. Or whatever we want to call them. Okay. So, we've talked about chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 79 what the GSMOC looks like, what the GSR looks like. What you do with the GSMOC and GSR placing subjects on the GSMOC proximity tight versus local connection mental associations, not logical connection basic pose, in the extreme. Connection with P and page 1 half subjects feeder subjects pattern we've also talked about things I didn't plan originally and don't really fit here use of metaphysical structures. Information architecture's future. More on PFTs. So, it's talked about. We're done. What else is here in the extra subject architecture? Subject sectioning, how subjects are made, just a interconnect process of constructing handling king the new subject special subjects, chrono, strategy, site guys tracking, and others. Okay, just a moment. It's hot here in Seattle, this summer. I need a glass of water. Done. So, subject sectioning. Let's see what's on the map. What follows is just gibberish in my lookup process, S5, S14, S19, S82, S43, S44 transfer P to S74 interface, S15, S5 purpose, in by S sectioning, three sectioning, growth process, can get right first time, constellations SYS, S4, SYS, S4 carry about, systems, S4, looking up, SYS, S4 programming and DSNs and notebooks have in common. Diving up functionality slash work flash thoughts into constellations. Dealing W flash border chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 80 cases. Ambiguity. Ideally multi-categorized. S14 dividing when big. Many speed thoughts equals division likely S19 splitting subjects. When one domain knowledge used make conclusion in second. Second is primary. If many many try go more general. If one object many contexts. The object. X act to S9. Particular relevance in the domain gets it. X act to S39. If one object in one context, the context, to aid in mapping. A action suggested in particular domain gets it. X act to S26 or 28. Act to look up. Act to S9 archives. Action to S9. Looking up. Act to S9 ideals, spirit, and self image. Spirit in context of ideals and self-image where am, where go. Sent to spirit ADC to S39 it's okay to hold social theories. Just don't believe you are right. Understand your ideas are non-scientific, inductive. Connected S37, forwarded to social. Back to S37 give up being right. Super complexity, non-scientific thinking, science impossible, W flash in abstract domains of political issues in life. Much happier W flash O. Back to S26 keeping SCH for interacting W flash friends. ADS. S82 subjects can become big. L things ordinarily small may take on great importance in your life. And grow own place in framework. X if X T on. Bible may be whole subject. Or even individual books in Bible. S43 thought focus areas can be tight XIMGN or loose XMP S44 identifying key locus and peripheral locus transfer P to POI transfer entry S74 moving on trays. Don't renumber if don't have to. Open spaces AOK. -okay. Interface S15 interfacing between subjects of note keeping and P and P, ahem. There's no way that I've just come up with all that just by sitting here typing away. I'd be lucky to have recalled half of it. I'm certain I would have missed splitting subjects, a very important ruling that I have so internalized, that I've forgotten I know. Okay, so, here we go. Sit realizing time. One way of cutting it up thoughts in a subject subject purposes constellations of thought within a subject how this is like other things in life. 
skill in one is skill in the other. In by section thoughts chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 81 how did it happen? Interface between subjects. P and P resectioning M by S section thoughts poi transfer splitting subjects growth process of subjects can we get the subjects right the first time? No. Dividing subjects why subjects get big when to do it how to do it tight and loose subjects the ultimate stage of growth the book. I like that. I'll use that as the guide for discussing subject sectioning. First thoughts in the subject. How you get a thought and then figure out where to put it and then how to move it from one subject to another when things get mixed up. You get a thought, and you want to place it in the subject that's purpose it best aligns with. Most of the time, you know where to put the thought immediately, but some thoughts are tough. Your first line of defense is the jizimok. You look in the general vicinity of where the thought goes, and see what your options are. Nine times out of ten, this tells you what you need to know. Occasionally, You'll need to go back to your P and P, and figure out what you intend. When you decide, you may need to annotate your P and P, especially if it was silent when you needed its help. Now remember, your P and P is to be interpreted loosely. It says include and exclude, but it doesn't say only include. It just says include. Anything between include and exclude is up to you to think about. Otherwise, we'd be spending all day writing a single P and P or constantly updating the PNP. But sometimes even with this loose interpretation of the PNP, you will still not be able to place the thought. That's good. There are three things this can mean. 1. You've got to put the thought on the unblackable list. A mysterious list that I never gave second thought to, appears before all the speeds, and forgot to write about. Dow Doesn't even appear on my notebook's SMOC. This is the case for out there thoughts that have nothing to do with anything you've been writing. This is the boring case. 2. Your splitting thoughts. More on that below. Chapter 4. Extra subject architecture 82 3. This is the exciting case. Your thought has broken your conceptualization system. There's something wrong with the way you've been thinking about things, and you need to go in and reorganize your thoughts, in such a way that it can account for this new thought of yours. It's a lot of work sometimes, but you'll find that the automatic processes of the notebook system are not the major benefits. Yes, they help, but they bring you to the places where you can clearly see the hard work that needs to be done. Incidental thought is great, but there's difficult work to be done in intentional thought as well. I say difficult because the process is not well understood I'm working on it, and because it generally takes a while to do, especially relative to incidental thought, which requires minimal work. Reorganizing can be time-consuming, but the rewards are enormous. You are moving to a whole new way of thinking about whatever it is that is important to you. The revolutionary change. Congratulations. But it is still a lot of work. So, you place your thoughts by purpose, and it may involve some difficult cross-subject work, but for the most part, 99 is a pretty easy process. Your thoughts build constellations within your subjects. This is a very important and a very powerful metaphor. This is something that I have found true in many fields. I believe this is something that AI Rhesus Archer should be paying attention to though they probably are already. Oh by the way, I think that anyone who is interested in AI should read this book and practice it. This process is very, very, very mechanical. That's boring to us humans, but computers love it. And I think that computer AI would be performing a much more complex version of the process. But I think that the basic framework may very well be this process, just more formal. Okay, I'm done pretending like I know about the field of AI. I don't. When you are building a computer program, you have all these little thoughts. But they aren't thoughts they are requirements, promises, stuff like that. You can scatter them out, then organize. Collect related ones. There's usually multiple ways to organize them, different ways of considering the same exact thing. You put closely related ones together, and that's called cohesion. And others are apart, but connected, and that's cuddling. Sound familiar? They are little constellations of requirement. The process is half art and half science. Same for business construction, where it's basically the same process, but with people. So, why mention this? Because it's general. If you know the practice in one, 
you know it in the others. Here too as well. Now what happens when you MIS section your thoughts? First, you want to think about what that means. Is this something that you are doing a lot? Perhaps you need to clarify your organization, or you want to set up some sort of process for thoughts in this domain, until you internalize the organization. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 83 Next Determine where the thought is going Say you're moving something from PFD public field technologies into a collab electronic collaboration. You make a mistake by putting it into PFD, and it's a straightforward matter to move it to eCollab. First, you put the thought in the eCollab speeds. Give it the next available number. Then, cross it out of PFD, in red. Also in red, write eCollab S57, or whatever subject and speed number is the target. Simple enough. You want to keep the record of where it went, because you might have links to the original. If you are absolutely certain that you've never mentioned the original anywhere else, you've never linked to it, then you can completely cross it out, without linking to the new location as well. But I usually just link it, I don't like to worry about absolute certainty. Your poise are a little more difficult. If you've written a poise, but later I find out that you put the entire poise in the wrong place. The process is a little more involved. What you do is you take the poise out of the first, insert an owl card in its place pointing to the new location, and then insert the poise in the new location. You also have some renumbering to do. Now, what's the new location? If there's not already a poise with a given number, you can just take that number. For example, if I'm moving the PFD P7 to the Ecolab P7, but Ecolab only has four poise Ecolab P1, Ecolab P2, Ecolab P3, Ecolab P4, then just let the poise number sign remain the same. Who cares if there are gaps? Put it in the seventh slot on the TOC, or don't list it on the TOC at all, until the sixth has been reached, at which point you can list P7. But sometimes you just have to renumber the whole thing to a new poise number sign. When renumbering, whenever possible, you want to cross out rather than white out, or eliminate. That is You'd like to be able to see the history, if at all possible, without fucking this up too much. But, like all rules, sometimes you'll just have to say history be damned. Look to the future. Finally, in this area of placing thoughts in subjects and resectioning, I want to talk about some tough nuts to crack. I call it splitting subjects. This is a thought that isn't merely out there. Nor does it somehow break your system. It's just clearly highly relevant to more than one subject. I have built some general rules for such thoughts, and you may want to make up some of your own. Now hold on, this is pretty abstract. Don't worry, I'll give examples of each. They are one. When one domain's knowledge is used to make conclusions in a second domain, the second domain is primary. Chapter 4. Extra Subject Architecture 84-2 If there is a many-many relationship among domains, Try to go with the most general domain, if at all possible. 3. If there is one object in many contexts, try to put the object in its own, native domain. If such a thing exists. 4. But if you have one object in one context, put the object in the context. 5. If there is a particularly relevant domain, that domain gets it. In order to aid in mapping. 6 an action in a particular domain the domain gets it. Yes, that is pretty heady and out there. It's also fairly arbitrary, you can and should make up your own rules, as you come up with them. Just be consistent record them somewhere. I would imagine that you would have the notebook subject, like my own, or something like it. This is just something to go from. So, examples. 1. When one domain's knowledge is used to make conclusions in a second domain, the second domain is primary. So, say you have some thoughts about ethical rules in electronic collaboration. I happen to have both ethics and ecolab in my notebook. Which should it go in? Ethics, because I want to collect all my thoughts about ethics into a coherent framework, or ecolab, because I want to be aware of ethical considerations when I work on electronic collaboration. I put it into ecolab, and I use this rule to help me make decisions like that. There is certainly such a thing as thinking about ethics abstractly. This is highlighting the limitations of paper systems it's difficult to put a thought into places at once. Computer systems, when they overcome their too costly restrictions, 
will solve this problem for us. When you obey this rule, you don't need to place a link on the jizmok. If you did so, it would quickly become a big enormous tangled mess. If you want to, you can run over to the ethics subject and put a link on the map to your thought way over in electronic collaboration. But I wouldn't do that. Such a promise to yourself would be way too costly to keep. We must live with the imperfect. Tolerate errors. If this is hard for you, start fucking things up by attaching imaginary false links in one place I guess. Start making up links that go to creatively unrelated places. That's my solution to your dilemma, at least. So applying subject 1 in subject 2, put thought in subject 2. 2. If there is a many many relationship among domains, try to go with the most general domain, if at all possible. However, if you have some situation that is incredibly complex, with multiple applicabilities, just go for the most general one you can find. This is just a messy situation. See if maybe another rule applies, if you don't like this. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 85-3 If there is one object in many contexts, try to put the object in its own, native domain. If such a thing exists. So, I have an actual real example from real life here. I had a thought like this reflect on a role of spirit in the context of ideals and self-image, where it is at, where it is going. So, it was biting amid spirit, values, and personal identity. Actually, at the time, personal identity didn't exist, so technically, it was between spirit, values, and personal psychology. But that's just nitpicky. Where did that go? It went to spirit. The focus of the thought was clearly on spirit in these other contexts, so I put it in spirit. For, But if you have one object in one context, put the object in the context. This is just a special case of rule 1-2 subjects, go with the one that's the context. 5. If there is a particularly relevant domain, that domain gets it. In order to aid in mapping, I had thought that it's okay to have social theories, just understand that all positions are fragile, and necessarily by the shape of things, non-scientific, inductive. I put that in society. Later, it would have gone into social ideology. I would have placed it in science or epistemology, or something, but I really wanted to see this thought whenever I thought about society, it's an important self-admonishment. So, put your thoughts wherever they will serve best. 6. An action in a particular domain The domain gets it. If you have a possible action that you can apply in a particular domain, put it in that particular domain. This is again a special case of rule 1 put specific things in specific places. A good general super rule, I guess then, is put specific things in specific places, and general things in general places. And that is what I call splitting subjects. I have the image of throwing a stone thought tablet over a pile of rocks, and seeing where it rests. I guess it's a bad name. In future versions of this text, I can't call it something better. So we've talked about how thoughts roll over subjects. How they get in, how they settle somewhere, how they get kicked out, how they go somewhere else. This is all in the context of extra subject architecture. It doesn't make much sense to talk about this within the framework of a single subject. Next, I'm going to talk about the growth process of subjects. Can we get the subjects right the first time? No. Dividing subjects why subjects get big when to do it chapter 4 extra subject architecture 86 how to do it tight and loose subjects the ultimate stage of growth the book so you have a subject you pick a good one to three word title it can be as specific or general as you like frequently you start out general and then with time as you collect thoughts you extract items that are specific for example I started with metaphysics. After about a hundred speeds collected, however, I pulled out spirit, ethics, imagination, and personal psychology. You pull them out by looking at your thought stars. You'll identify constellations, and you'll separate out those that are clearly separate and distinct from the others. Sometimes you'll pull out things that are still pretty interconnected. That's still useful. Just document the interconnection on the P and P. And you might want to draw in some wormholes on your maps, linking across subjects. Now can you get a subject right the first time? That is can you predict how your thoughts are going to come out? 
I have found that it's rarely the case that I can't do a very good job of it beforehand. That's because of what I call the symphony principle. If someone knows a canonical name for this, let me know. Lion at speakeasy.org. It works like this if you don't listen to symphony music a lot, and then you hear some, you say, oh, it's symphony music. And then if you hear another, you say, oh, it's more symphony music. There's little difference between the two pieces. But if you'll listen to it a lot, then you start to discriminate better. You can start to identify major trends big differences. With time, you can even identify subtle differences. With even more time, those previously subtle differences become vast enormous chasms, and you are picking out still subtler differences. The same is true for art. If you pay attention to an art style for a while, you start to understand things that other people don't. The meaning of a slightly thicker line, a slightly different shade, a slightly different position. Or clothing. Some people are experts at what clothing communicates to ourselves, or to others, and they can make subtle differences that we cannot cognize, yet still influence us. Lots and lots of subtlety. And the same thing happens with our notebooks. We approach a subject. It has meaning to us, for some reason. We feel drawn to it. But it is amorphous. We cannot divide it. If we could divide it, we'd be much cleverer people. But we cannot, at the moment. So we approach it, and subscribe to that sound stream of thought. We start writing it, and then grabbing the night sky. We telescope in on it, and find pinpoints of still smaller stars. And we identify constellations, and constellations within constellations. So I don't believe we can just get it right the first time. We have to listen to it first. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 87 So if in doubt, go general in the beginning. Then, extract subjects within as you discover difference. Now, how do you separate out subjects? Just as we have described before. You take the speed thoughts, and transcribe them arg to new speed lists. Make sure that when you cross them off from the source speed list, that you include a note about where it's going perhaps the initials of the destination subject, and the speed number sign. Move other resources as well, ref, pj, pars, poise, everything. Place out cards that point to the new location. It is tedious, but not nearly as tedious as keeping several subjects in the same exact notebook. Transcribing speeds is the most tedious. In the computer section, I'll describe a program that, if written, could take 90 work off of our hands. Basically most of the work in the notebook system is based on speeds. But speeds are also the most non-graphical element of the system. If we just program in a good mapping system, which requires some graphic manipulation, but not a whole lot, then we could enter the speeds from pant subjects, quickly, because we're typing, and then we never ever have to transcribe again. 90 print out the maps and speed lists, whole punch them and put them into the notebooks, but I'll talk about this program more in the computers section, when you perform this pattern, of listening to a subject, and then separating out the constellations, you find yourself frequently with what I call tight and loose subjects. That is, the ones pulled out are tight, that have a specific focus, but the source subject, that's still loose, it serves as a sort of anything that's not one of those things. The loose source can serve as a source, yet again but attention distributes out to the tighter subjects. Over time, the tighter subjects take on a life of their own, and occasionally spawn off even more subjects. I had society, which had a child named Global Information Architecture, which had children named Anarcho Science about the motion of traditional study from corp slash gun slash mill slash university to the public field and public field technology about fields that can help people benefit and organize themselves. PFT then dramatically reshaped the Jizmok. So, these things take on lives of their own, mirroring what occurs in your mind. Sometimes, however, a subject reaches and fullness. You feel good about what is present. You do not want to lose it. It is reasonably complete. You may have improvements or changes in mind, but you want to preserve what you have made. At that point, I believe, the appropriate thing to do is to write a book. I mean, that's what I'm doing right now. My notebooks section reached a certain fullness. Obviously, my notes were not perfect, but intentional thinking rather than incidental can fill out some of the things I either felt was missing, 
or too obvious to me to have noted but that a stranger might not know about. After you have written a book, you have a solid base for further progress. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 88 I think everyone should do this as they have a subject that is not researched yet. Help, there are even some justifications if something is researched yet. You may see where this leads I'm talking about not just the integration of thoughts within your mind, but between us as well. I'm talking about social organizing. Right? One of the interesting things about the notebook system is that, unlike most other endeavors, you don't really need the purpose. Napoleon Hill said that major efforts require definiteness of purpose. But what can't we say? We live in the universe without clear purpose. But maybe, buried within ourselves, is some motion that is pushing us. I don't know if this is purpose in the same way, but it feels to me like there is some kind of motion, and that it is expressing itself. I agree that this is metaphysical, but I am only describing what I have observed. When I start keeping notes, I need no purpose. You need no purpose to analyze the traffic in your head, the traffic of all these thoughts zooming about. But you start analyzing them, and you start detecting patterns, and seeing what's happening. And it's amazing. Perhaps you do see the direction there. You never had a sense of purpose before, but you do see that there is a direction inside of yourself, and you see it visually, mapped out in front of you. Anything you think about, maps out in front of you. If you have an unconceived urge, it will appear, in your notebooks. Low frequency patterns get captured and mapped. Whatever is inside of you. Perhaps I'm going off the deep end here. And perhaps I'm just seeing something in myself, and overly generalizing it to all people. Nonetheless, I wouldn't feel right if I didn't write about what I saw. You need not believe me, nor agree, nor see the same thing yourself in order to practice the notebook system. But let me know if you have any thoughts on the matter. I have big dreams for these ideas, but I also have difficulty seeing this as anything more than an intellectual novelty item right now. Now back to writing books. You don't have to write books in order to show to other people. You can just write it for yourself. That way, you feel okay saying that the subject is done. You can put the notes in archive, and have no fears that your notes will be incomprehensible to you a decade later. But I would put it online, for people to see. We have no way of mapping our thoughts together, yet, online. We have Google indexing, we have DM Hosey, but these are not quite the same thing as maps. They are the OCs and indexes. They have great limitations in making structure clear. We talked about this already. We also have the references problem to address on a social level, that a singly reference covers many 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 topics. That's why we sometimes, in the red TOCs, that we may pick out a single chapter of a book as a reference, or distribute a single book's contents over several subjects red TOCs. Similarly, posting our books online, we will have difficulty linking contents from a single chapter for extra subject architecture 89 source across multiple maps. However, I believe we can and will link contents effectively, far more effectively than we do so so far. This book, itself, is a single element of what I call the PFTs. It is on the personal end of the spectrum from individual to global empowerment. That is, if I'm not completely bonkers, and that this system is actually of some use to somebody, though I would not be surprised at all if this is actually a poor system, and that there are far better ways of doing things than I have described here. There is also the question of are we amassing some knowledge, laboring to build something, when someone elsewhere, whom we cannot access, for whatever reason, has already far surpassed what we are laboring to build? Was it useful for Indians to invent bows and arrows, when people across the globe had guns? I think it was useful for them. Because, locally, within their sphere, it was better than anything they had before. The people who are distant and inaccessible are just that distant and inaccessible. We can only affect what we affect our local sphere. I believe we should take efforts to be as strategic and open and as international as possible. I believe that these thoughts are not original to me, that these are ideas that many people have, everywhere. I don't like it when some writer says, ah. These are my great ideas. Others have gone before me, but these are my ideas, extending on those before. Many people don't have the resources to articulate what they've had. 
I've seen many times that it is clear in a field what steps need to be taken, though not everyone is jumping to write about them, it just seems like common knowledge. Individuals and corporations jump to claim the credit for themselves. I believe all of this will change in the future. Not because it would be nice if it did, but because as our ability to communicate, out here in the public field, is increasing dramatically. The reasons why corporations work is because they are organized by communications, dollars, and geographic proximity. But proximity is becoming meaningless. And there are far more people out here in the public field than the dollars can support in the comparatively small private networks. Further, the communications gap is narrowing, with instant messaging and video networks. People who just happen to be interested, but are across the globe, can organize just as well as the guys at the company struggling to find the meeting time. So I believe it is very possible that we can, if we take action, make our public field powerful. But nobody knows the future. I've diverged considerably. Most of this should have gone into the theory of notebooks chapter, chapter V. Sorry, I'm getting ahead of myself. If I take the time to reorganize the book, or if the reader rewrites the book you are welcome to do so, please respect the public license if it applies and feel free to write about the same exact things in your own words, with your own thoughts, then. We can put these things in the right places. We talked about subject sectioning, how subjects are made, interconnect, just eight. Chapter 4. Extra Subject Architecture 90 Next is a very brief section, about the process of constructing and linking a new subject. Finally, we talk about special subjects, like chrono, strategy, ZGS tracking, and others. Constructing and linking a new subject This is just a checklist, for you to follow in your mind, as you create a new subject. No need to be exact, of course. Tolerate errors. Make a new tab for the subject, and put it in the common store. Put your pre-existing pages for example, one half subject speed lists, unplaced notes in the new tab. Place an entry for the subject in the GSR, and the GSMOC, in the carry about binder. Write up the PNP and place it in the P&P section of the common store binder, up front. Take out one of your subject speed pages, and set it up for the new subject, supposing you don't already have one. Put it in the carry about binder. That's about it. I don't remember if there is anything more you need to do at the time. It doesn't need to be a big process. For about one half of my subjects, I don't have P&P pages. It works just fine. Many subjects are self-explanatory, and not intertwined with other subjects. Finally special subjects chrono strategy site guys tracking and others there are some subjects that are special. Sometimes, you have subjects that cut across several subjects, such as strategy. That's where I've collected my ideas about what should I do. What would be most strategic? Within individual subjects, you may have strategy ideas as well, particular to that individual subject. My strategy subject was just a T.O. feed and a bunch of chronologically sorted pages, numbered simply 1, 2, 3. My chrono subject was the same way, except instead of being about strategy, it was basically just the standard diary or journal how I felt, what was going on around me, etc. Chapter 4 Extra Subject Architecture 91 I also kept in my notebook my calendar month pages from my implementation of the GTD system, as months passed, and my site guys lists. Site guys tracking is an interesting thing that I did. At the start of every month, you make a blank sheet and write to Site guys. March 2003 If this is a Site guys sheet for the month of March 2003, whenever I found myself in a subject for a while, I'd put a brief two to three word description of the type of thing I was thinking about, if it wasn't already present on there. At the end of the month, you have a list of about 10 to 20 general items showing what you've been thinking about. You store the page in the chrono notebook as the month rolls over, and you can look back and see how your thinking has changed over time, what you are thinking about, what is important to you, etc. If I were to do this all again, I would probably make up a special segment for the site guys CG within chrono, and I'd use set the experimental chronological episodic segment to track threads through time. It can definitely be structured better. There are no notebook police you can make up your own special subjects. Equals done. We've talked about the physical representation of the complete system, the GSMOC, the subject registry, how subjects are made, 
just eight, interconnect, the process of constructing new subjects, and the special subjects. Woohoo! Chapter 5 Theory of Notebooks In this chapter, I want to talk about why notebooks. What are we trying to do? How do the notebooks work on an abstract level? Ideas about thinking. This is a short chapter, I've already intertwined many of the ideas about how things work in the previous chapters. Why notebooks? Major reasons reduce repeated thinking prevent lost progress observe mind minor reasons storage and retrieval living strategically repeated thinking is when we think the same thoughts, over, and over, and over again, without really getting anywhere. Lost progress is when we have solved the situation before, but we go back and return to it. Frequently we find ourselves in one frame, a frame that we've already solved before. Surely, if we kept records and mapped our thoughts, we could keep a map in mind, and identify our position on the map and the transitions to solve states. 90 to Chapter 5 Theory of Notebooks 93 This applies technically. It may be possible to apply psychologically as well. My technical attempts have been very successful, but my psychological attempts have had only very limited success. The best function has been to keep myself internally up to date with my thoughts, I did not lose much knowledge. I can give a demonstration of something that I gained I discovered at one point that large-scale social ethics are too complex to calculate, and that social ideologies are necessarily unscientific. It's something that I had discovered before in my life, but somehow had lost. This time, when I learned it, it was clearly there in my notebooks. Any time the thought came that ignored that conclusion, it had to be placed into the integrated structure. It would eventually come to the test of the principle that large-scale social ethics are too complex to calculate, and thus died, or was cast as a member of a particular social ideology. Either one I subscribed to or didn't. But I recognized over time that even though particular social ideologies are more in line with my values than others, that the whole thing is so complex that I cannot say with a degree of certainty which is better than another. That progress was not lost, as it was before. Now, I am not using the binders. It has been a few weeks since I have stopped. I am not testing everything against the binders is everything lost. I don't believe so. We're getting into ideas about thinking, so we'll just continue into it. I mentioned that the binders have a freezing effect on the mind. That's true, it can stagnate your mental growth. Perhaps there is a way around this, by computerizing parts of the system, as I described below in order to make it more fluid. But by the same token, it is also reinforcing. I am no master of psychology or metaphysics, by any stretch. But, I have found a model of learning that is agreeable to me. Michael N. wrote that we learn things and forget them, learn things and forget them. His idea was that these build layers in our mind that, though we can't see them, are still there, and support us. Thus, they still benefit us. Performing the notebook system for a period of time seems to be like organizing your conscious thoughts, and etching the foundation in your mind. Whether it is good or bad, it can be remade later. Since we're here, I have a couple other ideas about thinking that I want to explore repeating thoughts, incidental thought, and active thinking. Is our thinking process structured? I'll start with is our thinking process structured? Just at a glance, it seems rather chaotic there's a thought here, a thought there and another one. However, it once occurred to me to find the patterns in my thinking. I found one, and built a collection of markup icons to label the different pieces. I am not alone in this idea. Robert Horn did something similar, but Chapter 5, Theory of Notebooks 94 he did it to technical documentation, rather than to an individual writing his thoughts, thinking a problem through. See what kinds of writing have a future. By Robert Horn www.stanford.edu Horn slash images slash squad I have not seen his full classification system for elements of explanation, but I can't describe my own loose structure for elements involved in my thought process it includes incentive problem to solve question goal starting point, reflection, contemplation, brainstorm collapse, organize, order articulation request, articulate this hidden thought analysis slash dissertation request, Analyze this situation into parts map, model, vision, structure, rule, principle, law name, definition, exclusion, boundary. See also connection quotation hazard, warning, rebound, redirection, 
leads to research request list point concluding principle, therefore possible action possible. Future concluding question chapter 5. Theory of notebooks 95 concluding goal concluding problem flag double check request these are the primitive elements of thinking that I have found so far, and I have found a few common aggregates as well. This is beyond the domain of a book on notebook systems, but I thought it was related enough that I should include the idea. I use the above icons graphics not included, sadly to identify the major elements of my thinking, and how they piece together. They appear most commonly in poise and on speed lists my PSEE column. Next there are different thought moods. Warning this is not something that I have tracked, and not something that I have given any organized thought to. So what follows is off the cuff, and may well be wrong. Most of our time, we're either doing work and focusing on the very next task to complete if we are fortunate, or we're repeating thoughts about just whatever. Those thoughts are largely uninteresting, rehashing whatever we already know in a particular domain. After a while, however, we can come across a solution, or glimpse a new vision, or get something that is truly useful. We stumble across a puzzle piece. Somehow, I don't understand quite how, it seems that the mind gives you solutions if it knows that they will be implemented. If you are habitually throwing out good ideas, over time, it seems to me, your mind stops giving you solutions. But by keeping your thoughts in a trusted system, the mind gets happy about solving problems, and gives you more pieces. This is what I have observed, now that I am not keeping my notes, and have been tossing good ideas left and right, they appear to be dissipating. I don't worry about this, I know that I can pick up my notebooks whenever I like, and good thoughts will start surfacing again. There's also a certain mental mobility possible when you aren't keeping notes. While you can lose ground, you can also leap high in ways that the note-keeping process makes difficult. There frequently come points in the day, where, all of a sudden, a million thoughts come to you at once. I don't think that it's that your brain suddenly gets hyper, rather, I think it's that one idea triggers another idea, and then that another, and the frequently trigger ideas across subjects, across great mental distances even, and there's this sort of chain reaction. Recording it is quite a wonderful experience, unless you don't happen to have a piece of paper around, in which case it's a miserable experience as you start having thoughts and compacting them into RTDVD syllables. So, we've talked about day-to-day -day repeating, about how good ideas come spontaneously and about when we are concentrating the icons of thought fit in here. Chapter 5 Theory of Notebooks 96 Finally, one of my favorite topics in theory how do notebooks work on an abstract level. As opposed to the previous section, this is something I have thought out well, and carefully integrated. We have a subject matter, information, knowledge, and wisdom. And then we have the process of handling all that, with the aid of the note-keeping system. First, the subject matter information knowledge wisdom information is little pieces of idea that you have. Your speed lists will probably consist mostly of information. After you collect a bunch of information, you'll detect patterns and relationships. As you integrate ideas together, it becomes far greater than the sum of the individual pieces, it becomes knowledge. What is wisdom? I define it as knowledge that has been integrated with your life, or integrated with your living systems. That is if your knowledge makes a difference in how you life, then it is not just knowledge, but wisdom as well. The old Dungeons and Dragons handbook never had such a description, but suggested by analogy. To paraphrase knowledge is knowing about rain. Wisdom is knowing to come in when it rains. By my criteria for wisdom, it explains the D&D &D analogy perfectly. The person who knows about rain is thinking about rain as collections of integrated information but the person who is wise is actually doing something based on that knowledge. Now, the notebook system is a system for manufactured knowledge and wisdom. Here's a diagram of how it works. L slash slash backslash slash 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 backslash I slash 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 backslash slash backslash slash backslash F backslash O O slash O O E backslash slash backslash slash Backslash 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 slash slash backslash 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 slash slash backslash backslash slash chapter 5 Theory of Notebooks 97 How's that? Do you like it? Isn't that great? What?
You want me to explain it to you? Okay. Equals left star at the left that's your life. Your life emits many many thoughts through your mind. The thoughts are the little stars s however, most of the thoughts are uninteresting. The first step is to collect the good thoughts together. You put them onto your can subject speeds and your speed lists. Then, through various mechanisms such as the subject speed lists, and the hint, maps, and just looking over your speed lists and recognizing, your thoughts are placed into locals, places where related thoughts are found. That's represented by the three major arrows, pulling the collected thoughts into specific locations. After a few thoughts are collected in the same place, you think about them. That's the opening part of the diagram. There are two little stars at the end of the middle big arrow, and those thoughts are then reflected upon, likely in a poise entry. Whoa! Suddenly your two thoughts became a gigantic number of thoughts. This is a time for expansion. Your brain's forming, the thoughts are flying. You don't necessarily want to limit your thinking right now. This is time for explosive hot thought on thought action. Your job is to write down what these things make you think of. You have reflect on, analyze this, lists to build, all sorts of things. It blowing out. After you reach a certain point, you've written up your major ideas. Now, you can see them all, and you can start organizing them. This goes in the opposite direction. Instead of making ideas, you are reducing them, by packing them together into a synthesis. Some will go away, some will be compacted, some will be found to be identical representations of the same thing, etc etc. Finally, you end up with a synthesis the square arrangement of four O's on my diagram. Congratulations! You have a conclusion, a synthesis. Not necessarily, it may be that you've created a model, too, or something else. Regardless, you have a product. It can be shipped, arrow to the right. But what happens now is that it feeds back into your system. Perhaps, by building your synthesis, Several previously existing speed thoughts are unimportant, since the poise is such a good job of encapsulating them. You can put the poise number sign on the map, take off the S number sign S. If you like to preserve the S number sign S, you can put them in their place in the final poise entry where they end up. There are many things you can do. The resulting thoughts also affect your thought collection system. Perhaps new subjects are suggested, or new constellations within existing subjects. Perhaps new maps need to be made. Chapter 5 Theory of Notebooks 98 And finally, your new synthesis affects your life. This is akin to Michael Hens learning and forgetting. The thoughts coming out of your head will now be different, by the new edition. This is my understanding of the process. There is room for greater understanding. Identify the types of thoughts that come through. As I mentioned above, Eve attempted to identify some basic elements of problem solving. Identify the types of synthesis, and the impact they have on other sections. I cannot shake the feeling that this model has implications for the AI community. If the types of thought and synthesis were understood better, it may be mechanically implementable. There is still the life region of the map, where the ideas come from in the first place. I think that by some analysis of personal psychology, that could be understood better, and abstracted for computers. Something to do with placing the tension by strategic consideration and the mere position of the organism. I have now described my system to my satisfaction. The next two chapters are on the question of computers, and how to get started. Chapter 6 The Question of Computers Ah, my favorite chapter. Equals This is where the future is. Not just the distant future, but the near future as well. But face it computers suck at giving us the detailed and speedy drawing capabilities we need to think fluidly on paper. It just takes way too long to diddle with selecting text, changing font size and colors, quality, and let's not even talk about drawing, even if you are armed with a way calm. For anything that requires small levels of drawing power, you're pretty much going to have to ignore the computer. However the most tedious parts of this notebook system have nothing to do with drawing. What are the most tedious parts of the system? Maintaining TOCs. Transcribing speeds redrawing maps of those three, the first to take up about 90 time, and art major pains in the S. Fortunately, computers excel at those things. Maps is a little more difficult, because it requires some drawing power. However, I believe that mech construction can be safely taken over by the computer. 
Here's my vision during the day. You use the ultra convenient but in the present pure paper notebook system, dangerous pan subject speeds. You don't number them, you just keep them. Then, at night, you go to your computer, and, with your mad 133T typing skills, quickly transcribe the pan subject speeds which are 90 went our icons and images. You run the magic program, and bam! 99 Chapter 6 The question of computers 100 it spits out updated pages over your printer. You take out the pages, hole punch them, and put them into your binder. Yacht! The speed lists that come out are ultra dense, but in a readable size that you chose. With columns, you're fitting 100 speeds to the page. And when you want to split the subject into pieces, you just tell the computer where you want your speeds to go mbks 13 f 19 sbd 43 at 44 f 49 im 51 im 62 f 93 at 121 yesterday that could mean in mental technique regarding the speed thoughts send number 13 to fx number 19 to spirit number 43 to fx number 44 to fx number 49 to imagination number 51 to imagination number 62 to fx Number 93 to FX, number 121 to Spirit, so much faster. Right now, doing that work will require at least 10, maybe 20 minutes, as you write the speed thoughts all over again. Such speed. Such automation. And the best part is this isn't complicated at all. A programmer of one year could do this. Do it in C Sharp or Python. Help, you can use using Word and Command Word to write the text in and perform the printout. I've thought a little about the architecture of such a pro program, I'll describe it in just a moment, in a git block. If you are not a programmer, just skip it when we get there. If you are a programmer, and you think you might want to implement this, read that section. And it's not just about the speed lists put your POI titles in there too. And put your refs in there too. If there's a TOC for it, put it in there. It can print out high-quality laser printer ultra-info-density tables for us. Just imagine having all of that power on a single page, and so quickly. Oh, let me tell you something, I love my notebook system. You already know that. And I wouldn't switch my paper notebook system for my old computer systems, however. Chapter 6 The question of computers 101 but the hybrid I am describing, the hybrid will tap the incredible power that the computer system has. What's that power? Raw speed. It's low on quality, and sadly, for poise and arses and ref entries, that's the real killer, despite the speed. But it's fast. I used to capture hundreds of thoughts per day, easily, with my weird file. It's just so damn easy to control tab into a text buffer and start yanking away. Next thing you know, you've control tabbed back and you didn't even notice you were gone. You didn't have to fish out a page. You didn't have to open a binder. You didn't have to pick up a pen. You just started yanking. And it was stored. You didn't even think about it afterwards. So many thoughts. The problem was that you couldn't make diagrams and stuff, and there was no way to map. But we have an interface to those capabilities, namely, the printer. So I have high hopes for the hybrid. But wait. There's more. After that, after we have this system going, which will get rid of just enormous quantities of the labor of the system, and bring in so many missed thousands it gets even better. After this is going on, we can build something cooler. We've already taken the TOCs and speeds of our hands. Next to go is the mocks. Breeze and tumbleweed, the mocks. But aren't they, graphical? Doesn't that mean, graphical input? Isn't that what the computer can't do well? Well, yes, that's true. But our maps using only a tiny little bit of graphics. That is, we are drawing lines, and changing the signs of text, and using a few standard icons. With some UI work, I believe strongly that we can make this program, and make it easy to use to boot. It'll be easier to use than Dia or Visio. How can that be? Because we are performing a limited set of standard operations on our maps. I believe those operations are very finite and can be mapped over key combinations very easily. It shouldn't be hard. And it can be made to interoperate with the preceding system, that is, the system that just maintains TOCs and speed lists. Imagine this you open up the mapping program, 
and art faced with the Jizmok. You see the Jizmok, and in the distance, in the distance are floating the unplaced ideas, in a long list. But, you aren't concerned about that right now, your strategy tabs are reminding you that it's really important that you are focusing on global knowledge infrastructure right now. Ah, yes. Chapter 6 The question of computers 100 Do you click on GKI and find yourself within the next map, the GKI? You see the front page map, and you see a bunch of unplaced thoughts in a list. You start clicking and dragging the thoughts through the map. You can even doubly or triply place them, if you have multiple views on the same subject, and naturally thoughts apply in multiple places. You can build wormholes in empty space pointing to other wormholes. You can access a clipart library, and place clipart in. You can hide or show text for speeds. If you roll your mouse over an iconified speed, the entire text of the speed appears in a window. You can clip the speed to switch between titled and iconified form. With this tool, you never have to redraw a map, because the blemishes have built up. And when you are done with a session, the printer will print out the updated pages, so that you can keep the physical notebook current. If you are carrying a subject with you, you can then access your beautiful maps, and show them to people, and quickly use them in the heat of a conversation. Now how's that? I think that's awesome. I want to do it. I want it. The first program is easy. The second one is a little more difficult. The UI master could really help build the second. But the first a first year programmer could do it, alone, without too much trouble. So, if this was done, the notes system may take so little labor, that we might not even be paralyzed by it. Or not. After all, I don't necessarily know that it's the labor of the system that induces paralysis. It may very well be that map switching is still cumbersome, and induces mental paralysis or that the mere fact of taking the notes is interruptive enough to induce mental paralysis. I don't know. But, I'd like to do this improved system, and we can find out for ourselves, firsthand. Reflect. Let me know if you start a project to implement this system. I may start implementing it myself, I may not. Who knows what I'll do after I finish this version of this book. I may revise it. I may go on to work on the program system described here. More if I go on to work on organizing a visual language conference here in Seattle. We'll see what happens. Chapter 6 The Question of Computers 103 Finally, well, not finally, there's still the git block to write. I want to briefly describe this system, as applied in the far future, maybe a decade or two away. In this far future, we have magic paper. We have paper that we can roll out and it has a computer system in it, and we can write on it as if it were paper, and it would work just like paper. So there would be no difference between physical paper and this magic paper, except that the magic paper is better. What would the notebook system be like? Well, it's a little hard to say. I hope the hybrid system, once completed, and then once evolved beyond what I can't see right now, will have more to say about that. But basically, the binders could be eliminated completely. Here's my wish list for the future system. Multi-categorization. Scroll wheels or something like it on the side. Infinite canvas, and a zoom dial. Multicolor flash font selections on the pen. Text OCR to dimensions, font, quality, italics and bold style square sloppy niceness tools. Icon programmability. In turn multi-categorization I am astonished by how many modern notebook systems allow you to write your thoughts, and then throw them into a category tree. Really? You should be able to throw them into zillions of category trees and maps. And not by a directory tree mouse navigation system, but with speedy tab completions and smart DWIM to handle typos and stuff. And you should be able to navigate to all of the maps that the thought participates in quickly. Because UI mechanisms are in their infancy these days, it's understandable that you can't throw thoughts into maps. But there's poor excuse for not being able to throw them into multiple tree structures. It's just so easy to implement, and yet all of these award-winning computer notebook systems don't let you do it. I mean, I've done it. I made a weird file. And a casual internet browser and later friend made a simple program that interpreted my weird fine, and drew up the category trees. It was neat I downloaded his program, and could navigate my thoughts. 
Wow. Cool. So it's definitely not complex. So damn it. If they put in all these cool features in the next decade or two, the least they can do is allow very simple multi-categorization. Chapter 6. The question of computers 100 for scroll wheels call me a Luddite, but I do believe there are times when physical things are better than just drawings of them on a computer screen. I'd like a nice physical scroll wheel on the left side and on the bottom side or whatever, just pick two perpendicular sides that I can scroll to move about the screen. Maybe not my brightest idea. Maybe it'd be better to put the hand grab button on the pen itself. Infinite canvas and zoom dial okay, again, maybe the zoom dial isn't the best idea. But the infinite canvas stays. If you can't pan and zoom easily, then there is no reason to limit the size of a paper. Now, slightly more radical I'd like to be able to zoom in and out infinitely. Yeah. I'd like to be able to fit an entire world in the dot of a lower case I. More I'd like to be able to zoom in, and the gigantic words fade away, and are replaced with the zoom in of the contents beneath. I really want this, because I'd like to pack lots of detail. I'd like to have a big 2D diagram that is an overview of a system, and then zoom in on a portion, and see that system in its entirety. You should be able to say, visible within depth range 1000 to 100, and then content smoothly alphas into oblivion outside of that zoom range. So there. The color wheel may have been dumb, but that wasn't. Multicolor flash font selections on the pen. I don't know why the Wacom pen doesn't have any buttons for a selector on it. WHO wants to move the pen over to the side of the screen to change color. Just flip a switch. You can switch between for settings, perhaps red, blue, green, and black. Whoa! So original. Text OCR to dimensions, font, quality, italics and bold style. The OCR needs to discriminate the dimensions of text that it is nice seeing, and try to match font as well. It should recognize italics. If you are pressing hard on the pen, it should be bold. If possible, it would be neat if it could simulate distortion. If you write sloppily, the text would come out a little sloppily. People assume that we want all text to look nice. In reality we don't. Most don't know it consciously, but when you are thinking about something seriously, you write better. And when you are thinking offhand, you write sloppily. And when you look at the page, you can discriminate good from bad by the quality of the text. That is not an ability we want to lose. Thus, it would be good if the OCR system can detect degree of sloppiness, and then simulate the sloppiness after it's done its OCR thing. Chapter 6 the question of computers 105 Of course, there's going to be text too sloppy, or context too unsure, that the OCR system can do nothing but leave the input as it was. Southeast lobby I. Sometimes I can't read my own handwriting. How could OCR? Southeast lobby I. Square sloppy niceness tools. Finally, I want a setting on the pen for when you are drawing. On the pen, you flip the switch, or maybe it's on the paper whatever, and now the system knows to nips a feed what you are drawing. You draw a sloppy square, it renders a square square. Sloppy circle to circle circle. Sloppy oval to oval oval. Sloppy poly to nice poly. Nice nice nice. Even sloppy text to nice text. It would turn off the distortion detection. That helps you build maps and stuff. By con programmability. As our visual language grows and grows, our references to icons and clipped art will likely grow and grow. You will need to be able to say, when I draw a sloppy circle with a sloppy arrow pointing roughly to the right inside of the sloppy circle, I want you to replace it with this nice pre-established green pristine circle with a precise standard arrow pointing exactly to the right inside of the green pristine circle. Or, if I draw the kanji for a man in here that s just to subtle strokes. I want a nice icon of a man to appear here in its place, sized to the dimensions of the kanji, and line balanced evenly with the rest of the nice text on this page. Okay. So, you've seen my laundry list. That's the far future. With luck, it's within the next two decades. When these days arrive, what great things we can do. What coordination we will be capable of. What collaboration. What self-organization we will be capable of when we can finally communicate clearly and universally. We will be able to think with new clarity, 
and gain from the thinking of others. Finally, at the end of the chapter, is the Geet Block. Geet Block begins a possible architecture for today. I would code it in C Sharp or Python. System resources printer txt xml equals sql by file slash 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 back slash slash input database access plus lists slash back slash entrees by goodie slash 151 backslash subjects slash ids backslash output configuration output changed duplicates chapter 6 the question of computers 106 pages page output system dot 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 txt you can input by file changes or by goodie slash 151 invocation diagnostics output requests input change requests add entries change slash update slash annotate entries move entries mark to archive new subjects output requests request duplicates of pages request all pages updated since last request and action update from the latest request and return a receipt diagnostics debug information manual vision flash manipulation of internal databases database statistics database abstract the database system may want to use pure interfaces or a bridge pattern can use XML, email, SQL, TXT file, or whatever, to be a form of the database. I myself would go with YAML. The database keeps track of your lists TOCs, speed lists, the entrees in the lists speeds, TOC entries, their contents, hints, and titles, the subjects and their abbreviations, and the present output configuration TXT, doc, party F, font, size, color. Blah blah blah. Output system chapter 6. The question of computers 107 start simple. While you could do a lot of cool tricky output things, I'd start dirt simple. For a word dot doc output, just say two columns, point eight text, tagged, fit 70 to the page. Don't worry about making optimal use of space for now, that gets tricky when you start updating speeds, making some longer, and then text rolls over onto the next page and then that page might roll over, and you have to keep track of which pages need reprinting and which don't. Yeah, 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 yeah. Just keep it dirt simple for this first trial. And that's about it. It's really a very simple program. And it helps you out so much. Geet Block ends Chapter 7 Getting Started Let's face it, this system is big. This system is complex. This system is formidable. I originally didn't have this chapter in mind. But after talking with my first adopter, found myself writing additional information about how to start. So here it is. The most important thing to do is start small. Here's the plan 1. Make a pan subjects speed list. 2. Identify patterns. Make one half subjects. Make a jzmock. 3. Create your first subject. 4. Onward and upwards. 1. Make a pan subjects speed list. You can either make one on your own, or, and I highly recommend this, go to speakeasy.org lion slash nb, and download the word dot doc pan subjects speed template. Make flash print out a few of them. Then just start taking notes. As interesting ideas occur to you, just start taking notes. Don't worry about subject. Help, if you are uncomfortable with it, don't even worry about hint. You're new to this cut yourself some slack. Just do this for a while. Maybe a day or two, until you get about 20 to 50 speed thoughts, whatever you are comfortable with. 2. Identify patterns. Make one half subjects. Make a jzmock. Go over your pan subject speeds. Locate patterns. Ask yourself what kinds of things am I thinking about? 108 Chapter 7. Getting started 109 What do I care about? What are some important studies among these thoughts? From these, you should get some ideas for your first subjects. Don't worry if you find that among 20 speed thoughts, you have 15 different subjects. Don't worry at all about the scattered. What you will find, is that, as you develop your subjects, many will attract your thoughts to them, and become focuses. It's sort of like a gravitational mass. You start collecting some thoughts, and then they start collecting more thoughts, and then, and don't worry. We're just putting these ideas into half subjects. That means we aren't doing tags and whatnot here. We're just maintaining speed lists for the subjects. So, you're finding patterns. Then, either make your own subject speed lists, 
or print some out from the web page. I recommend the printouts. Don't worry, they're free. I'm not charging for this. Because I'm cry a a a a a a the all. Just get them and print them out. Transcribe from the pan subject speeds to the half subjects. At this point, we're doing good, but we haven't really transcended the bucket level of notebook systems. Remember what I said at the beginning of this book 99 notebook systems out there today are just the bucket system, or the diary system, or some basic combination of the two. Now, you should get a binder at this point. Put the subject speeds into the binder. Put some blank template pages blank pan subject speed pages and single subject speed pages into the binder, and put in your subject speeds, alphabetically. You'll also make Jizmok V1, the first version of your Jizmok. Remember, the first version will contain your first GSR on it as well. No need to alphabet these, the list is so small. Now do this for a while. Do this until one of your subjects reaches, say, 10 to 20 speeds. 3. Create your first subject. Since you have only one, you can just store it in your carry about binder. At this point, make the SMOC and start practicing the mapping process. Make your first map of your thoughts. You may want to reread the Wake Thrust in Chapter 3 of Making a Map, but this time with your very own thoughts. Now you'll start to see the power of this system. The map is where it all comes together, literally. For onward and upward. Do this again. Chapter 7. Getting started 110 Make more subjects. And start writing poise. Start getting a little strategic. You'll also start having problems. Reread this book. You'll start seeing why things are set up the way they are. You'll start having dilemmas in placing thoughts. Reread my suggested rules for subject splitting. And see if they make sense to you. You are just starting to learn this system. When you've done it yourself. It's a totally different thing, and very exciting. You'll start to see the need for P and P, and you'll start having tensions between subjects. Reflect them on the Jizmok. Keep building new half subjects, and then promoting them to full subjects. You'll find that time is limited. Now use those sticky tabs. Arrange to go on your shopping trip, if you haven't already, and get the pieces that can help move you along. By this point, you shouldn't need much help. You'll see how the ideas at work here fit together, and your paper intake will increase. You'll start integrating your study and research into the system, and lining it up on the maps. You'll probably start to see little things that I knew but forgot to put in here, and you'll start to see what I mean by mobilizing. And yet, if you are anything like me, you'll perceive value in this, and continue on. Time will pass. I predict the more you think and value and reflect, the more you will be compelled to action. You will gravitate towards something, or some things, and you'll see things in your head that you've never seen before. Things that are so real, you can't touch them. You may question the relative significance of the physical world, compared to the realm of ideas. Things take on new dimensions, and you are compelled to act in new ways. Eventually you will need to stop, and you will do so. And you will act. And your acts will be organized. I am just speculating now. I am the only person who has ever practiced the notebook system I am describing. But let me tell you we have never completed a major project. I mean, sure, there have been some minor projects. And I have completed major work projects, that I was paid to complete. But I have very rarely copied major projects. Not that I can remember. Well, I'm in the last lines of this book. Chapter 7 Getting started 111 Granted, the book is rough. Granted, the book is gritty. But god damn it, if I'm not writing on the 6831st line, I, who have never written a complete book, have finished this thing. Well, maybe I'm overthinking things, but this is not common in my life. I know my weaknesses, I accept them. But I have a theory that the notebook system is somehow a focusing system of not only thoughts, but also of some sort of mental energy. And that it builds, and builds and builds as you think, think, and think. And that when you are done thinking, you are compelled to act. And the action works. Again, I have never written a book. Now to be honest, it's a shabby book. I know. I'm not an experienced writer. But here at Island, it's shabby, but it's a book. It's practice. 
and I am immensely proud of this. I suspect it is due to the notebook system working. So let me know how it works for you. I am tired now. You can't help in my writing. This has been an exhausting effort, this whole last week and a day. But it's over now. I feel like I've just lectured for a whole week straight. With work in between. So please forgive my tiredness. But I want to say let me know how it goes. Email me lion at speakeasy.org. Tell me, personally, how it goes. And if you implement the computer system, or want to, or want to help, or want to see how it's going, Go to my web page speakeasy.org lion slash ebby slash and check to see how it's going. And if it's not, maybe that's probably because you're the first to try email me at lion at speakeasy.org and let me know you want to start and I'll link people to you. You can work together or separate, however you like. And feel free to call me or write to me. I love to hear from you. Lion Kimbrough 12,038 31st of 8 Northeast Number 201 Seattle, Washington 9812526.440.0247. Yes, you can call. Just say I read your notebook's book. Call at whatever crazy hour. Let me know. Maybe you live in India or China or something. But if it isn't too expensive, call and let me know. I'd love to hear from you. And if you have any questions or thoughts, or anything, feel free to let me know what they are. If you want to help with the web page, or make a discussion board, or a wiki, or something, let me know. Chapter 7. Getting Started 112 O. If you want to donate money, you can do that too. My PayPal thing it is also under lion at speakeasy.org. That'd be great. Then Kitty my girlfriend might also feel that the notebook system was worth something Laugh okay? Take care. With love, lion equals appendix the acronym say suppose, absolute cosmic eternal perfect ontological structure. Something we try to avoid in this notebook system. The structure maps your brain, not the universe. Don't even try. Madness that weight lies. Leave it to the standards committees. It's not your job here. Unless you are using your notebooks to engineer the standard. In which case, you already know about the madness. The term I made up on the flight, while writing this. I kind of like it now. They suppose. He At least it's not as cheesy as universal cosmic habit force. Acts, act communication thought system. My own personal hybrid between GTV, and the notebook system described in this book. I do not describe the interface between the two, it isn't all that complicated, and is of little interest to most readers of this book, I suspect. Keep in mind that the notebook system here is anti-ethical to GTD. GTD promotes action. This system demotes action. If you do maintain GTD as you perform this system, you will have to realize that you are going to vastly reign in the GTD. Your action pages will dramatically dwindle. On the other hand, your someday flash maybe S will balloon out vastly, no small wonder than that as part of the interface. I've absorbed the someday flash maybes into the subject's speed lists. If people write to me asking for elaboration on the Axe Notebook GTD interface, I'll write about it. But for the most part GTD just withers in the presence of this system. See the question of computers for some software ideas that, if implemented, may open up the possibility of having both doors open at the same time. I think my most common use of the GTD system was for looking up books at libraries, getting to web pages to look at, doing my chores, keeping dates and as a mechanism to remember when to refill my blank papers and whatnot. They slash s, abbreviations slash shorthand. Where you will keep your shorthand notes and abbreviations so that you can write quickly, and yet still be able to figure out what you were talking about a few years later. Each section has 113 appendix A. Acronyms 114 its own A slash s, and there is a global A slash s across all subjects as well. Global A slash S should have a page for names, and some hash pages for common abbreviations. FF. Final Fantasy. I wrote this is the way. I was quoting Final Fantasy Tactics. You perform jobs, and your characters say things like I had a feeling, and this is the way. Never mind. su totally not important, save in some sort of strange schizophrenic holistic universe way. In which case. 
This entry is the crux of this entire book. This is the way. You be the judge. GKI, Global Knowledge Infrastructure. Like pure FD, something that happens to be a subject of mine, but I like it, and I used the acronym in the book, so I get to advertise the concept here. Hey, 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 I'm tricky, aren't I? GKI is the study of who knows what, and where. It's the study of how field grow and fall. It looks at things like the CIA and corporate knowledge bases and public understanding and universities and says what does that mean? Who's got the information? Who's got the knowledge? How is it spreading? Where does it come from? Ideas such as anarcho-science, studying the motion from university slash gov slash mill slash corp to the public sphere are interesting. How computer science makes more progress in the pub LZ and corporate sphere than it does in the university system. Something to pay attention to, especially if you are interested in a democratic society. And know too that there are enormous fields, vast fields, that are completely untouched. Why? Because there is no profit in them. But there is profit to the public. It just has to study these things, the government's not going to do it. The corporations sure as hell aren't going to do it. We have to do it ourselves. CPFD. Geomock, same as Jizmock. Jizmock, the grand subject mock. This is a map of every subject, and the central strategy point. Every subject that is not obsolete archived appears on the Jizmock. Frequently runs multiple pages, with the front page being a map onto the other pages. GSR, the grand subject registry. The two page or more list of all of your subjects. It comes right after the Jizmok. It lists all subjects, even those that may not appear on the map. You use it to attach flags and other metadata to subjects identified by name. GDD, Getting Things Done, by David Allen. Incredible book. Integrates best ideas from time management in ways that no other book does. Most books just give you a piece of wisdom here, a piece of wisdom there. This book puts it all together for you. Not really about notebooks, because he focuses on action, not thought. The GTD system and the system I described are really at odds with one another. Regardless, I still found utility in his GTD system, read it. Look up also at Sopendix A Acronyms 115I, Index, and Alphabet Based Index. Can contain numbers and glyphs as well. M, same as Mach. Never same as Chiz Mach. Mach. Map of contents. A visual map, frequently multiple pages though not uncommon to have just one page, for little reached subjects, of some domain. Generally, this is either a smock, jizmok, or a piece of one of those two. But rarely, within the notebook system, independent of those two. The function of a mock is to integrate, after all, so they tend to be all encompassing within a subject, or for the jizmok. The first page of a series of mock pages is generally a map of the reminder of the pages, and how they fit together. M tier K, mental techniques. Not related to no books, but like pure FD and GKI, you've read it before. So anyways. This is stuff like forming theoretical architectures of thought and using them to think fast. And memory techniques. And any other sort of mental gymnastics or study thereof. Read the memory book. Great book. Cheap. Far better than any other memory course I've ever seen. Far better than the multi dollars 100 courses I've seen out there. I could tell you many humorous stories. But I'm not going to. Not here, anyway. Read the internet memory how to. It has many of the memory book techniques in it, if you are impatient. But the book is better. PFD. Public field technologies. This isn't related to no books. It just happens to be something that I've had as a subject in my notebook. Regardless, I am evangelical about the topic, and I did use the acronym in my book, so I'll take this space to advertise it. There are some things that are just so incredibly cool, and have to do with benefiting the whole public, if people are interested in them, and want it. Self-help books are sort of a well-known thing, but tools for mental techniques and for keeping notebooks are not. And that's all in the personal arena. Communities can help themselves too. Learn about it at the hours and stuff like that. There are all sorts of things that people can do. Refer to my list in the middle of the book and learn about those things. This whole book, about notebooks, 
is an example of a public field technology, if it actually turns out to be good for something, and if people actually band together and study it. If PFDs work, then we'll have a radically different, and far more democratic in the real sense of the word world in the future. The Internet has such revolutionary potential, and it's great to see it turn kinetic. PFDs are divided by me into roughly two spheres the scale from personal to global, and the sphere of group collaboration, communication. For example visual verbal language is a PFD, but doesn't really have a good position from individual to global integration. So there you go. PJ, project. Pages connected to a particular project. Appendix A acronyms 116 point, point of interest. Usually multiple pages devoted to one limited subject delimited by the title found within a subject bound by a TOC generally placed on the smock P and P purpose and principles this is a very special page in each subject it is usually just one page I have never had more than one sheet per entire subject it describes the boundaries of the subject and how to delegate and in some cases even split issues that transcend the edge it features inclusions and exclusions, either in text or by diagram. P and PS, like speeds, rarely live within the subject's paper layout following the tab for the subject. Speeds are collected into the carrying about binder, joined with every other speed. Similarly, P and P for all subjects are collected into a special tab labeled P and P at the beginning of the common store binder. You refer to the P and P whenever there is a question about whether something belongs to a subject, or not, and you are trying to decide where it goes. Ref, short for reference. Reference items are annotations of books. If you can't, just write in your books and be done with it. But if it's a library book, or a borrowed book, or a web page, you're going to have to keep your co-writing and your side notes on your own pages, and then you put them in the red section. The ref section is unusual in that you don't do normal page numbering, and you don't even do normal TO thing. You do your page numbering to match the way the text is organized. And you assign the reference number not by the number following the last thing you wrote about, but by the number connected to the reference on your references list. Your references list is like your speeds, but it captures references. When you actually get around to reading a particular book, you take the number of the reference to be the first number in the page sequence. It doesn't matter if it's the second book you read in the subject if it is number 7, you will number the pages starting with 7, not 2. See also ours. Ours, short for research. Research is life reference, but usually focused towards an end, and not tied to a particular source reference. Don't feel like you need to have a ref articulation for each reference you touch. Just make sure you know the ref number sign S in the R's, so you can find it later, and dance from book to web page to personal to book, and keep a linear flow in your R's number sign. Have conventional TOCs over material, and, like everything else, appear in the SMOC. SMOC, Subject Map of Contents. The map of contents over an entire subject. Ideally, points to every single resource in the subject domain that is not in an archival stage. TOC, Table of Contents. I frequently wish that these things would just die. Sadly, our computer software infrastructure and UI notions don't seem to understand how to deal with anything that isn't text well. We don't appendix A. Acronyms 117 even have tools to make mocks quickly and well. So we are stuck with these archaic information destroying beasts. Basically, these are just an index of titles connecting them to page numbers. Icky 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 icky. Use a mock if you can't. But you frequently need a TOC as well, if for no other reason than to see what to number your next item. There are ways around this, just keep a record of next numbers. Still, it is comforting to have TOCs over your poise and refs and arses. V, I frequently use as short for version. Generally it's a lower case V. Ver, same as V. Appendix B C V S information. The information that follows is taken directly from the C V S database and is intended only to ease the translation of the book into L A T V X dollars ID book dot text B one point five August six two thousand three zero five zero one zero two A B G V X V dollars dollars log book dot text B dollars revision one point five August six two thousand three zero five zero one.
Zero to ABG added and debugged the glossary. Final big piece is in place. Found out that my rejects for replacing the double quotes with backslash latex quotes was too greedy. Read it did what I said, not what I meant. Built a fixer that corrected the problem. Fixed a few misspellings. Removed the global sans serif font directive now that I've seen how nice PD Playtex works. Revision 1 point for July 26, 2003 ABG changed the default font to sans serif to make it look better in PDFs. This is not a font that is desired for actual book printing. It will be removed for the book version as well as the one side documenting. Revision 1.3 July 26, 2003 06 ABG added a CBS chapter to the book to aid in version tracking. 118